Chapter Two of At the Foot of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. At the Foot of the Rainbow by Jean Stratton Porter. Reuben O'Kayam and the Milk Pail. Jimmy Malone, carrying a shining tin milk pail, stepped into Casey's saloon and closed the door behind him. He much as wine has played the infidel and robbed me of my robe of honor. Well, I wonder what the vintners buy, one half so precious as the stuff they sell. Jimmy stared at the back of a man, leaning against the bar and gazing lovingly at a glass of red wine as he recited in mellow swinging tones. Gripping the milk pail, Jimmy advanced a step. The man stuck a thumb in the belt of his Norfolk jacket, and the verses flowed on. The grape that can with logic absolute the two and seventy jarring sects confute, the sovereign alchemist that in a trice life's leaden metal into gold transmute. Jimmy's mouth fell open, and he slowly nodded endorsement of the sentiment. The man lifted his glass. "'I make the most of what ye yet may spend, before we two into the dust descend. Yesterday this day's madness did prepare, to-morrow's silence, triumph, or despair. Drink, for you know not whence you came, nor why. Drink, for you know not why you go, nor where.' Jimmy set the milk pail on the bar and faced the man. If er God, that's the only sensible word I ever heard on my side of the question in all me life, and to think it should come from the mouth of a man wearing such a go to hell coat. Jimmy shoved the milk pail in front of the stranger. In the name of humanity, empty yourself of that, he said. Fill me pail with the stuff and let me take it home to Mary. He's always got the beast of the argument, but I'm thinking that would corker. You won't? questioned Jimmy resentfully. Kipe it to yourself, then, like you did your wine. He shoved the bucket toward the barkeeper and emptied his pocket on the bar. Var, Kaisy, you be the sovereign alchemist and transmute that metal in the millwood pretty quick, for I've not wet me whistle in three days, and the belly of me is filling with burning autumn leaves. Give me a loving cup, and come on, boys. This is on me while it lasts. The barkeeper swept the coin into the till, picked up the bucket, and started back toward a beer keg. Oh, no, ye don't, cried Jimmy. Come back here and count that leaden metal, and then ye transmutin' it into whiskey straight, the purest gold ye got. Ye don't drown out a three days' thirst with beer. Ye ought to give me most two quarts for that. The barkeeper was wise. He knew that what Jimmy started would go on with the men who could pay, and he filled the order generously. Jimmy picked up the pail. He dipped a small glass in the liquor and held near an ounce aloft. I wonder what the vintners buy, one half so precious as the stuff they sell, he quoted. Down goes. And he emptied the glass at a draught. Then he walked to the group at the stove and began dipping a drink for each. When Jimmy came to a gray-haired man with a high forehead and an intellectual face, he whispered, Take your full time, Cap. Who's the rhyming incubator? Threadman, Boston, mouthed the captain as he reached for the glass with trembling fingers. Jimmy held on. You know that stuff he's given off? The captain nodded and rose to his feet. He always declared he could feel it farther if he drank standing. "'What's his name?' whispered Jimmy, releasing the glass. "'Rubaiyat, Omar Khayyam,' panted the captain, and was lost. Jimmy finished the round of his friends, and then approaching the bar. His voice was softening. "'Mr. Reuben O'Kayam, he said, "'it's me private opinion that ye need lace-trim pantalets "'and a sash to complete your costume. "'But barren clothes, I'm entangled in the thread of your discourse. "'Being a Boston man meself, it appeals to me "'that I detect the refinement of the East in your voice. 
now these me friends that i've just been treatin are men of these parts but we're the middle east so don't set up to equal the culture of the extreme east so mr o'cam solely for the benefit you might be to us i'm asking you to join me and me friends in the momentous initiation of my new milk pail jimmy lifted a brimming glass and offered it to the thread man do you transmute he asked now, if the Boston man had looked Jimmy in the eye and said, I do, this book would not have been written. But he did not. He looked at the milk pail and the glass, which had passed through the hands of a dozen men in a little country saloon way out in the wilds of Indiana, and said, I do not care to partake of further refreshment. If I can be of intellectual benefit, I might remain for a time. For a flash, Jimmy lifted the five feet ten of his height to six, but in another he shrank below normal. What appeared to the thread man to be a humble, deferential seeker after wisdom led him to one of the chairs around the big coal base burner, but the boys who knew Jimmy were watching the whites of his eyes as they drank the second round. At this stage, Jimmy was on velvet. How long he remained there depended on the depth of Melwood in the milk pail between his knees. He smiled winningly on the thread man. "'Ye you know, Mr. O'Kayam, he said, "'at the present time you are located in one of the wooliest parts of the Wild East. I don't suppose anything woolier could be found in the plains of Nebraska, but I'm reliably informed that they stuck up a pole and labeled it the center of the United States. Being a thousand miles closer that pole than you are in Boston, naturally we come by that distance closer to the great wool industry. Most of our wool here grows on our tongues, and we shear it by this transmutant process, concerning which you have discoursed so beautiful. But barring the shearing of our wool, we are the mildest, most sheepish folks you could imagine. I don't reckon now there is a man among us who could be induced to blat or to butt under the most trying circumstances. My Mary's got a little lamb, and all the rest of the boys are lambs. But all the limbs are waned and clustering round the milk pail. Ain't that touching? Come on now, Reuben. I'll up and edify us some more. On what point do you seek enlightenment? inquired the thread man. Jimmy stretched his long legs and spat against the stove in pure delight. Oh, you might loosen up on the work of a man, he suggested. These lambs of Casey's fold may learn things from you to help them in the stress of life. Now here's Jones, for instance. He's holding together a gang of sixty gibbering Italians. Any one of them would cut his throat and skip in the night for a dollar, but he keeps the beast in them under, and they're getting out gravel for the bed of a railway. Bingham, there is oil, he's punching the earth full of one thousand foot holes, and sending off two hundred quarts of nitroglycerin at the bottom of them, and pumping the accumulation across continents to furnish folks with light and hate. York here is running a field railway between Bluffton and Selina so that I can get to the river and the reservoir to fish without walking. Haynes is bossing a crew of forty Canadians, and he's taken the timber from the woods hereabouts and sending it to be made into boats to carry stuff across sea. Meself and me partner, Danny McNoon, are the ladylikest lambs in the bunch. We grow grub to feed folks in summer and trap the skins to cover em in winter. Corn is our great commodity, Plowing and hoeing in the summer, and husking it in the fall, is sich lamb-like work, but don't mention it in the same breath with tending our four dozen fur traps on the twenty below zero day, freezing hands and fight, and falling into air bubbles and building fires to thaw out frozen grub. Now here among us, poor little transmutant lambs should come a raging lion representing the culture and refinement of the Far East. By the pleats on your breast you show us the style. By the thread case in your hand you furnish us with materials our women can tuck their petticoats a fancy, and by the book in your hand you teach us your superiority. By the same token I wish I had that book in me head, for I could just squelch Danny and Mary with it complete. 
"'Say, Mr. O'Kayam, next time ye come this way, bring me a copy. I'm wantin' it bad. I got what you gave off all secure, but I take it there's more. The man goin' at that clip could shut off with them few lines. Do you know the rest?' The thread man knew the most of it, and although he was very uncomfortable, he did not know just how to get away, so he recited it. The milk pail was empty now, and Jimmy had almost forgotten that it was a milk pail, and seemed inclined to resent the fact that it had gone empty. He beat time on the bottom of it, and frequently interrupted the thread man to repeat a couplet which particularly suited him. By and by he got to his feet and began stepping off a slow dance to a sing-song repetition of lines that sounded musical to him, all the time marking the measures vigorously on the pail. When he tired of a couplet, he pounded the pail over the bar, stove, or chairs in encore until the thread man could think up another to which he could dance. Wine, 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 red wine, the nightingale cried to the rose, chanted Jimmy, thumping the pail in time, and stepping off the measures with feet that scarcely seemed to touch the floor. He flung his hat to the barkeeper and his coat on a chair, ruffled his fingers through his thick auburn hair, and holding the pail under one arm, he paused, panting for breath and begging for more. The thread man sat on the edge of his chair, and the eyes he fastened on Jimmy were beginning to fill with interest. Come fill the cup, and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. Smash came the milk pail across the bar. Hooray! shouted Jimmy. Bless ye! Bang, bang! He was off. Eardish on the wing, he chanted, and his feet flew. Come fill the cup, and in the fierish spring, fierish spring, birdish on the wing. Between the music of the milk pail, the brogue of the panted verses, and the grace of Jimmy's flying feet, the thread man was almost prostrate. It suddenly came to him that there might be a chance to have a great time. More, gasped Jimmy, me some more. The thread man wiped his eyes. Whether the cup with sweet or bitter run, the wine of life keeps oozing drop by drop. The leaves of life keep falling one by one. Away went Jimmy. Sweet or bitter run, lives of life keep falling one by one. Bang, bang, sounded a new improvision on the sadly battered pail, and to a new step Jimmy flashed back and forth the length of the saloon. At last he paused to rest a second. One more, yes, one more, he begged. A book of verses underneath the bough, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou, beside me singing in the wilderness, O oh, wilderness were paradise enough. Jimmy's head dropped an instant. His feet slowly shuffled in improvising a new step, and then he moved away, thumping the milk pail and chanting, A couple of fish poles underneath a tree, a bottle of rye and Danny besides me, a fishing in the Wabash, where the Wabash paradise, holy gee! Tired out, he dropped across a chair, facing the back, and folded his arms. He regained breath to ask the thread man, Did ye ever have a friend? He had reached the confidential stage. The Boston man was struggling to regain his dignity. He retained the impression that at the wildest of the dance he had yelled and patted time for Jimmy. I hope I have a host of friends, he said, settling his pleated coat. Damn hushed, said Jimmy. Just in way, now I got one friend, hushed all by myself. Be here pretty soon now. Always comes night like this. Comes here? inquired the thread man. Am I to meet another interesting character? Yes, comes here. Comes after me. Comes like the clock striking twelve. Don't he, boys? inquired Jimmy. But he ain't no interesting character. Yes, common man, Danny is. Honest man. Never told a lie in his life. Yes, she did, too. I forgot. He lies for me. Just lies and lies. Lies to marry. Tells any old lies to keep me out of scrape. Give have friend, hish up and drive ten miles for you, night like this, and lies to get you out of shrape. 
I never needed any one to lie and get me out of a scrape, answered the thread man. Jimmy sat straight and solemnly batted his eyes. Gee, you must miss most of fun, he said. Me I ever missed any, always in scrape. But Danny gets me out. Good old Danny, just like dog. To kill me all me life, see? All folks come on the same boat. Women get thick shuttle besides. Bill cabins together, works together, and dumb it they don't get smallpox and die together. Let me and Danny. So we work together just same, and we fall in love with the same girl. Danny too, slow. I got her. Jimmy wiped away great tears. How did you get her, Jimmy? asked a man who remembered a story. How the nation did I get her? Jimmy scratched his head and appealed to the thread man. Danny, best man, Melish, best man, never lie except for me, never drink except for me, always save his money except for me. Melish, best man, isn't he best man, Spooley? Ain't it true that you serve Danny a mean little trick? asked the man who remembered. Jimmy wasn't quite drunk enough, and the violent exercise of the dance somewhat sobered him. He glared at the man. What's you talking about? he demanded. I'm just asking you, said the man, why, if you played straight with Danny about the girl, you never have had the face to go to confession since you married her. Always sin my wife, said Jimmy grandly. Don't shinny woman that can't confess enough for two. Then he hitched his chair closer to the thread man and grew more confidential. She here, he said. First, I see your pleated coat didn't like, but head's all right great head. Stuck on frills there. Want to be let in on something? Got enough city, clubs, and all that? Want to taste real thing? Let's go coon hunting. This tree down, can oper, just short pleasant walk. Got fifty coons in it. Nobody knows that tree but me, she. Been good us boys, sat on the same chairs we do, educate us up a lot. You know most that poetry till I die, she. Wanna wash vintners by? Half precious ash stuff shell, she. I got it. Let you in on the real thing. Take grand big coon skinch back to Boston with you. Ringston tail. Make wife fine muff or fur trimish. Good till boys at club about she. Are you asking me to go on a coon hunt with you? demanded the thread man. When? Where? Cautiously invited, answered Jimmy. Tomorrow night, can oper show you plash. Bill Duke's dogs, my guns, moon shining, dogs howling, snow flying, fifty coons rolling out one hole, shoot all dead, take your pick, tan skin for yourself, raw and big fire swarm by, bag finest sandwiches ever tasted, milk pail, pure gold drink. No stop, slop going out over bridge, take a jug, big jug, toss her up and let her gurgle, dogs bark, fire pop, guns bang, fifty coons drop, boys all go, want to get more education, takes culture to get woolish off, shay, will you go? I wouldn't miss it for a thousand dollars, said the thread man, but what will I say to my house for being a day late? She got her grip, suggested Jimmy, never too late to get her grip. Y'all go, boys. There were not three men in the saloon who knew of a tree that had contained a coon that winter, but Jimmy was Jimmy, and to be trusted for an expedition of that sort, and all of them agreed to be at the saloon ready for the hunt at nine o'clock the next night. The thread man felt that he was going to see life. He immediately invited the boys to the bar to drink to the success of the hunt. You shoot your own coon yourself, offered the magnanimous Jimmy. You may cherish my guns. Take your first shot. First shot to Mr. O'Cam. Boys, remember that. Shay, can you hit anything? Take a try now. Jimmy reached behind him and shoved a big revolver into the hand of the thread man. Worst target, he demanded. As he turned from the bar, the milk pail, which he still carried under his arm, caught an iron rod. Jimmy gave it a jerk and ripped the rim from the bottom. Ish do. He said, splendid mark, shinish just like coon's eyes in torchlight. 
He carried the pail on the back wall and hung it over a nail. The nail was straight and the pail flaring. The pail fell. Jimmy kicked it across the room and then gathered it up and drove a dent in it with his heel that would hold over the nail. Then he went back to the thread man. There, Schmark, Reuben, blash away, he said. The Boston man hesitated. What's your matter? Can't shoot off nothing but your mouth? demanded Jimmy. He caught the revolver and fired three shots so rapidly that the sounds almost came as one. Two bullets pierced the bottom of the pail, and the other the side of it as it fell. The door opened, and with a rush of cold air Jimmy gave just one glance toward it and slid the revolver into his pocket, reached for his hat, and started in the direction of his coat. "'Glad to see you, Mignon,' he said. "'If you're going home, I'll just ride out with you. Good night, boys. Don't forget the coon hunt.' And Jimmy was gone. A minute later the door opened again, and this time a man of nearly forty stepped inside. He had a manly form and a manly face, and was above average in looks, and spoke with a slight Scotch accent. Did any of you boys happen to know what it was Jimmy had with him when he came in here? A roar of laughter greeted the query. The thread man picked up the pail. As he handed it to Danny, he said, Mr. Malone said he was initiating a new milk pail, but I'm afraid he has overdone the job. Thank you, said Danny, and taking the battered thing, he went out into the night. Jimmy was asleep when he reached the buggy. Danny had long found it convenient to have no fence about his dooryard. He drove to the door, dragged Jimmy from the buggy, and stabled the horse. By hard work he removed Jimmy's coat and boots, laid him across the bed, and covered him. Then he grimly looked at the light in the next cabin. "'Why does Nasha go to bed?' he said. He summoned courage, and crossing the space between the two buildings, he tapped on the window. "'It's me, Mary,' he called. The skins are only half done, and Jimmy is going to help me finish. He will come over in the morning. You go to bed. You need not be afraid. We will hear you if you even snore. There was no answer, but by a movement in the cabin, Danny knew that Mary was still dressed and waiting. He started back, but for an instant, heedless of the scurrying snow and biting cold, he faced the sky. I wonder if ye had not found the glib tongue and light feet the least part of matrimony, he said. Why, in God's name, couldn't you have married me? I'd like to know why. As he closed the door, the cold air roused Jimmy. Danny, he said, don't you forget the milk pail. I'll initiate good now. End of chapter 2 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com of at the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter chapter 3 the 50 coons of the canoper near noon of the next day jimmy opened his eyes and stretched himself on danny's bed it did not occur to him that he was sprawled across it in such a fashion that if Danny had any sleep that night, he had taken it on chairs before the fireplace. At first, Jimmy decided that he had a head on him and would turn over and go back where he came from. Then he thought of the coon hunt, and, sitting on the edge of the bed, he laughed as he looked about for his boots. "'I am glad you are feeling so fine.' said Danny at the door, in a relieved voice. I had a notion that ye would be crosser than a badger when ye came to. Jimmy laughed on. What's the fun? inquired Danny. Jimmy thought hard a minute. Here was one instance where the truth would serve better than any invention, so he virtuously told Danny all about it. Danny thought of the lonely little woman next door and rebelled. "'But, Jimmy,' he cried, "'ye cannot be gone all nicked again. "'It's too lonely for Mary, "'and there's always a chance I might sleep sound "'and wadna hear if she should be sick or need ye. "'Then she can just yell louder, "'or come after you, or get well, "'for I am going, see?' "'He was a thread peddler, "'in a dinky little pleated coat, Danny.' 
he laid up against the counter with his feet crossed at a dancing girl angle but i will say for him that he was running at the mouth with the finest flow of language i ever heard i learned a lot of it and cap knows the stuff and i'm going to have him get you the book but danny he wouldn't drink with us but he stayed to educate us up a little that little spoolman danny educating jones of the gravel gang and bingham of the standard and york of the electric railway and haynes of the timber gang not to mention the champagne rat catcher of the wabash jimmy hugged himself and rocked on the edge of the bed oh i can just see it danny he cried i can just see it now i was pretty drunk but i wasn't too drunk to think of it and it came to me sudden like danny stared at jimmy wide-eyed while he explained the details and then he too began to laugh and the longer he laughed the funnier it grew i've got to start said jimmy i've an awful afternoon's work i must find him some rubber boots he's to have the inestimable privilege of carrying me a gun danny and have the first shot at the coons fifty i'm thinking i said and if i don't put some frills on his cute little coat oh danny it will break the heart of me if he don't wear that pleated coat danny wiped his eyes come on into the kitchen he said i've something ready for ye to eat wash while i dish it i wish to heaven you were a woman danny said jimmy a fellow could fall in love with you and marry you with some satisfaction criminy but i'm hungry jimmy ate greedily and danny stepped about setting the cabin to rights it lacked many feminine touches that distinguished jimmy's as the abode of a woman but it was neat and clean and there seemed to be a place where everything belonged now i'm off said jimmy rising i'll take your gun because i ain't going to see mary till i get back oh jimmy dinna do that pleaded danny i want my gun go and get your own and tell her where ye are going and what ye are going to do she'd feel less lonely i know how she would feel better than you do retorted jimmy i am not going if you won't give me your gun i'll borrow one or have all my fun spoiled danny took down the shining gun and passed it over jimmy instantly relented he smiled an old boyish smile that always caught danny in his softest spot you are the best friend i have on earth danny he said winsomely you are a man worth tying to by gum there's nothing i would do for you now go on like the good fellow you are and fix it up with mary so danny started for the woodpile in summer he could stand outside and speak through the screen in winter he had to enter the cabin for errands like this and as jimmy's wood box was as heavily weighed on his mind as his own there was nothing unnatural in his stamping snow on jimmy's back stoop and calling open to mary at any hour of the day he happened to be passing the woodpile he stood at a distance and patiently waited until a gray and black nuthatch that foraged on the wood covered all the new territory discovered by the last disturbance of the pile from loosened bark danny watched the bird take several good-sized white worms and a few dormant ants as it flew away he gathered an armload of wood he was very careful to clean his feet on the stoop place the wood without tearing the neat covering of wallpaper and brush from his coat the snow and moss so that it fell in the box he had heard mary tell the careless jimmy to do all these things and danny knew that they saved her work there was a whiteness on her face that morning that startled him and long after the last particle of moss was clean from his sleeve he bent over the box trying to get something said the cleaning took such a length of time that the glint of a smile crept into the grave eyes of the woman and the grim line of her lips softened don't be feeling so badly about it danny she said i could have told you when you went after him last night that he would go back as soon as he wakened today i know he is gone i watched him leave 
Danny brushed the other sleeve, on which there had been nothing at the start, and answered, No, dinna ye misjudge him, Mary. He's gone to a coon hunt. To net, dinna ye see him take my gun? This evidence so bolstered Danny that he faced Mary with confidence. There's a traveling man freight Boston in town, Mary, and he was edifying the boys a little, and Jimmy dinna like it. He's going to show him a little country sport to net to edify him. Danny outlined the plan of Jimmy's campaign. Despite disapproval and a sore heart, Mary Malone had to smile, perhaps as much over Danny's eagerness in telling what was contemplated as anything. "'Why don't you take Jimmy's gun and go yourself?' she asked. "'You haven't a day off since fishing was over.' "'But I have the work to do,' replied Danny, "'and I could not leave.' He broke off abruptly, but the woman supplied the word. "'Why can't you leave me, if Jimmy can? I'm not afraid. The snow and the cold will furnish me protection tonight. There'll be no one to fear.' Why should you do Jimmy's work and miss the sport to guard the thing he holds so lightly? The red flushed Danny's cheeks. Mary never before had spoken like that. He had to say something for Jimmy quickly, and quickness was not his forte. His lips opened, but nothing came, for as Jimmy had boasted, Danny never lied except for him, and at those times he had careful preparation before he faced Mary. Now he was overtaken unawares. He looked so boyish in his confusion. The mother in Mary's heart was touched. "'I'll tell you what we'll do, Danny,' she said. "'You tend the stock and get in wood enough so that things won't be freezing here, and then you hitch up and I'll go with you to town and stay all night with Mrs. Dolan. You can put the horse in my sister's stable, and when you and Jimmy get back, You'll be tired enough that you'll be glad to ride home. A visit with Katie will be good for me, and I have been blue the last few days, and I can see you are just aching to go with the boys. Isn't that a fine plan? I should say that is a good plan, answered the delighted Danny. Anything to save Mary another night alone was good, and then, and then, that coon hunt did sound alluring. And that was how it happened that at nine o'clock that night, just as arrangements were being completed at Casey's, Danny McMillan stepped into the group and said to the astonished Jimmy, Mary wanted to come to her sister's overnight, so I fixed everything, and I'm going to the coon hunt too, if you boys want me. The crowd closed around Danny, patted his back, and cheered him, and he was introduced to Mr. O'Kayam of Boston, who tried to drown the clamor enough to tell what his name really was, in case of accident, but he couldn't be heard for Jimmy yelling that a good old Irish name like O'Kayam couldn't be beat in case of anything. And Danny took a hasty glance at the thread man to see if he wore that hated, pleated coat which lay at the bottom of Jimmy's anger. Then they started. Casey's wife was to be left in charge of the saloon, and the thread man half angered Casey by a whispered conversation with her in a corner. Jimmy cut his crowd as low as he possibly could, but it numbered fifteen men, and no one counted the dogs. Jimmy led the way, the thread man beside him, and the crowd followed. The walking would be best to follow the railroad to the canoper and also they could cross the railroad bridge over the river and save quite a distance. Jimmy helped the thread man into a borrowed overcoat and mittens, and loaded him with a twelve-pound gun, and they started. Jimmy carried a torch, and as torch-bearer he was a rank failure, for he had a careless way of turning it and flashing it into people's faces that compelled them to jump to save themselves. Where the track lay clear and straight ahead, the torch seemed to light it like day, but in dark places it was suddenly lowered or wavering somewhere else. It was through this carelessness of Jimmy's that, at the first cattle guard north of the village, the torch flickered backward, ostensibly to locate Danny, and the thread man went 
crashing down between the iron bars and across the gun. Instantly, Jimmy sprawled on top of him, and the two men followed suit. The torch plowed into the snow and went out, and the yells of Jimmy alarmed the adjoining village. He was hurt, the worst of all, and the busiest getting in marching order again. Holy smoke, he panted. I was having the time of me life, and plumb forgot that cow-catcher. Thought it was a quarter of a mile away yet, and like to kill myself with me carelessness. But that's always the way in troop sport. You got to take the knocks with the fun. No one asked the thread man if he was hurt, and he did not like to seem unmanly by mentioning a skinned shin when Jimmy Malone seemed to have bursted most of his inside. So he shouldered his gun and limped along, now slightly in the rear of Jimmy. The river bridge was a serious matter with its icy coat and danger of specials, and the torches suddenly flashed out from all sides, and the thread man gave thanks for Danny Macnon, who reached him a steady hand across the ties. The walk was three miles, and the railroad lay at from twenty to thirty feet elevation along the river and through the bottom land. The Boston man would have been thankful for the light, but as the last man stepped from the ties of the bridge, all the torches went out save one. Jimmy explained they simply had to save them so that they could see where the coon fell when they began to shake the coon tree. Just beside the water tank, and where the embankment was twenty feet sheer, Jemmy was cautioning the Boston man to look out when the hunter next behind him gave a wild yell and plunged into his back. Jimmy's grab for him seemed more a push than a pull, and the three rolled to the bottom and halfway across the flooded ditch. The ditch was frozen over, but they were shaken and smothered in snow. The whole howling party came streaming down the embankment. Danny held aloft his torch and discovered Jimmy, lying face down in a drift, making no effort to rise, and the thread man feebly tugging at him and imploring someone to come and help get Malone out. Then Danny slunk behind the others and yelled until he was tired. By and by, Jimmy allowed himself to be dragged out. "'Who the thunder was that come button into us?' he blustered. I don't allow no man to butt into me when I'm on an embankment. Send the fool back here till I kill him. The thread man was pulling at Jimmy's arm. Don't mind, Jimmy, he gasped. It was an accident. The man slipped. This is an awful place. I will be glad when we reach the woods. I'll feel safer with brown that's holding up trees under my feet. Come on now. Are we not almost there? Should we not keep quiet from now on? Will we not alarm the coons? Sure, said Jimmy. Boys, don't holler so much. Every blamed coon will be scared out of its hollow. Amazing, said the thread man. How clever. Came on the spur of the moment. I must remember that to tell the club. Do not hollow. Scare the coon out of its hollow. Oh, I do miles of things like that, said Jimmy dryly and mostly I have to do them before the spur of the moment, because our moments go so damn fast out here. Mighty few of them have time to grow their spurs before they are gone. Here's where we turn. Now, boys, they've been trying to get this biler across the tracks here, and they broke the ice. The water in this ditch is three feet deep and freezing cold, They've stuck getting the biler over, but I wonder if we can't cross on it and hit the wood beyond. Maybe we can walk it. Jimmy set a foot on the ice-covered boiler, howled, and fell back on the men behind him. Jiminy crickets! We never can do that, he yelled. It's a glare of ice and rounding. Let's crawl through it. The rest of you can get through if I can. We'd better take off our overcoats to make us smaller. We can roll them into a bundle, and the last man can pull it through behind him. Jimmy threw off his coat and entered the wrecked oil engine. He knew how to hobble through on his toes, 
but the pleated coat of the Boston man, who tried to pass through by stooping, got almost all Jimmy had in store for it. Jimmy came out all right with a shout. The thread man did not step half so far, and landed knee-deep in the icy, oil-covered slush of the ditch. That threw him off his balance, and Jimmy let him sink one arm in the pool, and then grabbed him and scooped oil on his back with the other hand as he pulled. During the excitement and struggles of Jimmy and the thread man, the rest of the party jumped the ditch and gathered about, rubbing soot and oil on the Boston man, and he did not see how they crossed. Jimmy continued to rub oil and soot into the heated coat industriously. The dogs leapt the ditch, and the instant they struck the woods, broke away from baying over fresh tracks. The men yelled like mad. Jimmy struggled into his overcoat and helped the almost insane Boston man into his, and then they hurried after the dogs. The scent was so new and clear the dogs simply raged. The thread man was wild, Jimmy was wilder, and the thirteen contributed all they could for laughing. Danny forgot to be ashamed of himself and followed the example of the crowd. Deeper and deeper into the wild, swampy canoper led the chase. With a man on either side to guide him into the deepest holes and to shove him into bushy thickets, the skinned, soot-covered, oil-coated Boston man toiled and sweated. He had no time to think. The excitement was so intense. He scrambled out of each pitfall set for him and plunged into the next with such uncomplaining bravery that Danny very shortly grew ashamed, and crowding up beside him, he took the heavy gun and tried to protect him all he could without falling under the eye of Jimmy, who was keeping close watch on the Boston man. Wild yelling, told that the dogs had treed, and with shaking fingers the thread man pulled off the big mittens he wore and tried to lift the gun. Jimmy flashed a torch, and sure enough, in the top of a medium hickory tree, the light was reflected in streams from the big shining eyes of a coon. Treed! yelled Jimmy frantically. Treed! And big as an elephant. Company's first shot. Here, Mr. Okayam. Here's a good place to stand. Gee, what luck. Coon in sight first thing, and Mellon's food coon at that. Shoot, Mr. Okayam, shoot! The thread man lifted the wavering gun, but it was no use. Tell you what, Reuben, said Jimmy, you are too tired to shoot straight. Let's take a rest and eat our lunch. Then we'll cut down the tree and let the dogs get cooney. That way there won't be any shot marks in his skin. What do you say? Is that a good plan? They all said that was the proper course, so they built a fire and placed the thread man where he could see the gleaming eyes of the frightened coon, and where all of them could feast on his soot and oil-covered face. Then they opened the bag and passed the sandwiches. I really am hungry, said the weary thread man, biting into his with great relish. His jaws moved once or twice experimentally, and then he lifted his handkerchief to his lips. I wish twas as big as me head, said Jimmy, taking a great bite, and then he began to curse uproariously. What ails the things? inquired Danny, ejecting a mouthful. And then all of them began to spit birdshot, and started an inquest simultaneously. Jimmy raged. He swore some enemy had secured the bag and mined the feast. But the boys who know him laughed until it seemed the thread man must suspect. He indignantly declared it was a dirty trick. By the light of the fire he knelt and tried to free one of the sandwiches from its sprinkling of birdshot, so that it would be fit for poor Jimmy, who had worked so hard to lead them there and tree the coon. For the first time Jimmy looked thoughtful, but the sight of the thread man was too much for him, and a second later he was thrusting an axe into the hands accustomed to handling a thread case. Then he led the way to the tree and began chopping at the green hickory. It was slow work, and soon the perspiration streamed. Jimmy pulled off his coat and threw it aside, 
he assisted the thread man out of his and tossed it behind him the coat alighted in the fire and was badly scorched before it was rescued but the thread man was game fifty times that night it had been said that he was to have the first coon of course he should work for it so with the axe with which casey chopped ice for his refrigerator the boston man banged against the hickory and swore to himself because he could not make the chips fly as jimmy did everybody clear out cried jimmy number one is coming down get the coffee sack ready base cooney over the head and shove him in before the dogs tear the skin we want a dandy big pelt out of this there was a crack and the tree fell with a crash all the boston man could see was that from a tumbled pile of branches dogs and men someone at last stepped back gripping a sack and cried got it all right and it's a buster now for the other forty-nine shouted jimmy straining into his coat come on boys we must secure a coon for every one cried the thread man heartily as any member of the party might have said it but the rest of the boys suddenly grew tired they did not want any coons and after some persuasion the party agreed to go back to casey's to warm up the thread man got into his scorched besuited oil smeared coat and the overcoat which had been loaned him and shouldered the gun jimmy hesitated but danny came up to the boston man and said there's a place in my shoulder that gun joist fits and it's lonesome without it pass it over only the sorely bruised and strained thread man knew how glad he was to let it go it was danny too who whispered to the thread man to keep close behind him and when the party trudged back to casey's it was so surprising how much better he knew the way going back than jimmy had known it coming out that the thread man did remark about it but jimmy explained that after one had been out a few hours their eyes became accustomed to the darkness and they could see better that was reasonable for the thread man knew it was true in his own experience so they got back to casey's and found a long table set and a steaming big oyster supper ready for them and that explained the thread man's conference with mrs casey he took the head of the table with his back to the wall and placed jimmy on his right and danny on his left Mrs. Casey had furnished soap and towels, and at least part of the Boston man's face was clean. The oysters were fine and well cooked. The thread man recited more of the wonderful poem for Danny's benefit and told jokes and stories. They laughed until they were so weak they could only pound the table to indicate how funny it was. And at the close, just as they were making a movement to rise, Casey proposed that he bring in the coon and let all of them get a good look at their night's work. The thread man applauded, and Casey brought in the bag and shook it bottom up over the floor. Therefrom there issued a poor, frightened, maltreated little pet coon of Mrs. Casey's, and it dexterously ran up Casey's trouser leg and hid its nose in his collar, its chain dragging behind. And that was so funny the boys doubled over the table and laughed and screamed until a sudden movement brought them to their senses. The thread man was on his feet, and his eyes were no laughing matter. He gripped his chair back and leaned toward Jimmy. "'You walked me into that cattle guard on purpose,' he cried. Silence. "'You led me into that boiler and fixed the oil at the end.' No answer. You mauled me all over the woods and loaded those sandwiches yourself and soared me for a week trying to chop down a tree with a pet coon chained in it. You! You! What had I done to you? You wouldn't drink with me, and I didn't like the dumb, dinky, little pleated coat you wore, answered Jimmy. One instant amazement held sway on the thread man's face. The next and damned if i like yours he cried and catching up a bowl half filled with broth he flung it squarely into jimmy's face jimmy with a great oath sprang at the boston man but once in his life danny was quick 
for the only time on record he was ahead of jimmy and he caught and he caught the uplifted fist in a grip that jimmy's use of whiskey and suffering from rheumatism had made his master steady jimmy wait a minute panted danny this man is not even wait ye yet when every muscle in your body is strained and every inch of it bruised and ye are daubed with soot and bedraggled in oil and he's made ye the laughing stock for the strangers by the hour ye will be just even and ready to talk to him every minute of the next he's proved himself a man and right now he's showed he's no coward it's up to ye jimmy do it royal be as much of a man as he is say ye are sorry one tense instant the two friends faced each other then jimmy's fist unclenched and his arms dropped danny stepped back trying to breathe lightly and it was between jimmy and the thread man i am sorry said jimmy i carried my objections to your wardrobe too far if you'll let me i'll clean you up if you'll take it i'll raise you the price of a new coat but I'll be dumb if I'll help put such a man as you are into another of the feminine gender. The thread man laughed and shook Jimmy's hand, and then Jimmy proved why everyone liked him by turning to Danny and taking his hand. Thank you, Danny, he said. You sure helped me to myself that time. If I'd hit him, I couldn't have held up me head in the morning. End of chapter 3《To the Foot of the Rainbow》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kay Hand《At the Foot of the Rainbow》by Jean Stratton Porter Chapter 4 — When the Kingfisher and the Black Bass Came Home Criminy, but you were slow. Jimmy made the statement not as one voices a newly discovered fact, but as one iterates a time-worn truism. He sat on a girder of the Limberlost Bridge and scraped the black muck from his boots in a little heap. Then he twisted a stick into the top of his rat sack, preparatory to his walk home. The ice had broken on the river, and now the partners had to separate at the bridge, each following his own line of traps to the last one, and return to the bridge so that Jimmy could cross to reach home. Jimmy was always waiting, after the river opened, and it was a remarkable fact to him that as soon as the ice was gone his luck failed him. This evening the bag at his feet proved by its bulk that it contained just about one-half the rats Danny carried. "'I must set traps in my own way,' answered Danny calmly. "'If I stuck them into the water only way and went on, so would the rats. A trap is no trap unless it is concealed.' "'That's it. Go on and give me a sermon,' urged Jimmy derisively. "'Who's got the bulk of the rats all winter? "'The truth is that my side of the river is the best catching in the extreme cold, "'and you get the most after the thaws begin to come. "'The rats seem to have a lot of burrows and shift around among them. "'One time I'm ahead and the next day they go to you, "'but it don't mean that you are any better trapper than I am. "'I only got seven tonight. "'That's a sweet day's work for a whole man. Fifteen cents apiece for seven rats?' I've a big notion to cut the rat business and compete with Rocky and I'll." Danny laughed. Let's hurry home and get the skinnin' over before Nick, he said. I think the days are growing a little longer. I seem to scent spring in the air today. Jimmy looked at Danny's mud-covered wet clothing, his blood-stained mittens and coat back, and the dripping bag he had rested on the bridge. I've got some music in me head and some action in me feet, he said, but I guess God forgot to put much sentiment into my heart. The breath of spring never got so strong with me that I could smell it above a bag of muskrats in me trapping clothes. He arose, swung his bag to his shoulder, and together they left the bridge and struck the road leading to Rainbow Bottom. It was late February. The air was raw and the walking heavy. Jimmy saw little around him, and there was little Danny did not see. To him, his farm, the river, and the cabins in Rainbow Bottom meant all there was of life, for all he loved on earth was there. But loafing in town on rainy days, when Danny sat with a book, hearing the talk at Casey's, at the hotel, and on the streets, had given Jimmy different views of life, and made his lot seem paltry compared with that of men who had greater possessions. On days when Jimmy's luck was bad, or when a fever of thirst burned him, he usually discoursed on some sort of intangible experience that men had, which he called seeing life. 
his rat bag was unusually light that night and in a vague way he connected it with the breaking up of the ice when the river lay solid he usually carried home just twice the rats danny had and as he had patronized danny all his life it fretted jimmy to be behind even one day at the traps be jesus i get tired of this he said always and forever the same thing i cape go on this trail so much that i got a speakin acquaintance with meself some of these days i'm going to take a trip and have a little change i'd like to see chicago and as far west as the middle anyway well you canna go said danny you mind the time when you were married and i thought i'd best be away and packed my trunk when ye and mary caught me ye got mad as fire and she cried and i had to stay just ye try going and i'll get mad and mary will cry and ye will stay home just like i did there was a fear deep in danny's soul that some day jimmy would fulfill this long time threat of his i didna think there is ony place in all the world so good as the place ye own danny said earnestly i dinna care a penny what anybody else has probably they have what they want what i want is the land that my father owned before me and the house that my mither kept and they'll have to show me the place they call eden before i'll give up that it beats rainbow bottom summer autumn or winter i dinna give twa hopes for the palaces men rig up or the thing they call landscape gardening when did men ever compete with the work of god all the men that have peopled the earth since time began could have had their brains rolled into one and he would stand helpless before the autonomy of one of the rats in these bags the thing god does is good enough for me why don't you take a short cut to the maiden house inquired jimmy because i would have nothing to say when i got there retorted danny i've a meetin house of my ain and it just suits me and i've a god too and whether he is spirit or essence he suits me i dinna want to be held to sharper account than he faces me up to when i hold communion with myself i dinna want any better meetin house than rainbow bottom i dinna care for better talkin than the tongues in the trees sounder preachin than the sermons in the stones finer readin than the books in the river no nor better music than the choir of the birds each singin in its ain way fit to burst its little throat about the mate it won the nest they built and the babies they are raising that's what I call the music of God, spontaneous and the soul of joy. Give it to me every time compared with notes from a book. And all the fine places that the wealth of men ever evolved wouldn't begin to compare with the work of God, and I've got that around me every day. But I want to see life, wailed Jimmy. Then open your eyes, mon, for the love of mercy, open your eyes. There's life sailing over your head and that flock of crows going home for the night. Why didn't ye or some other mon fly like that? There's living roots and seeds and insects and worms by the million wherever you are setting foot. Why didn't you creep into the earth and sleep through the winter and renew your life with the spring? If you'd stayed by the books as I begged you, there now would be that in your head that would teach you that the old story of the rainbow is true. There is a pot of gold, of the purest gold ever smelted, at its foot, and we've been born and own a good living right there. And the gold is there that i know wealth to shame any bilious millionaire and both of us missing the pot when we hold the location you've the first chance mon for on your life is the great prize mine will forever lack i canna get to the bottom of the pot but i'm gonna come as close to it as i can and as for ye empty it take it all it's yours it's for the mon who finds it and we own the location aha we own the location repeated jimmy i should say we do behold our hotbed of riches i often lay awake nights thinking about my attachment to the place how dear to me heart are the skeins of my childhood fondly gaze on the cabin where i'm doomed to dwell those chicken coop then pig pen these highly piled wood around which i've always raised hell jimmy turned in at his own gate while danny passed to the cabin beyond he entered, set the dripping rat bag in a tub, raked open the buried fire, and threw on a log. He always ate at Jimmy's when Jimmy was home, so there was no supper to get. He went out to the barn, wading mud ankle-deep, fed and bedded his horses, and then went over to Jimmy's barn and completed his work up to milking. Jimmy came out with a pail, and a very large hole in the bottom of it was covered with dried dough. Jimmy looked at it disapprovingly. I bought a new milk pail the other night, I know I did, he said. Mary was kicking for one a month ago, and I went after it the night I met Reuben O'Kayam. Now what in the nation did I do with that pail? I have wondered myself, answered Danny, as he leaned over and lifted a strange-looking object from a barrel. This is what you brought home, Jimmy. Jimmy stared at the shining, battered, bullet-punctured pail in amazement. Slowly he turned it over and around, and then he lifted bewildered eyes to Danny are you foolin he asked did i bring that thing home in that shape honest said danny 
I remember buying it, said Jimmy slowly. I remember hanging on to it like grim death, for it was the one excuse I had for going, but I don't just know how. Slowly he revolved to the pail, and then he rolled over in the hay and laughed until he was tired. Then he sat up and wiped his eyes. Great day! What a lot of fun I must have had before I got that milk pail into that shape, he said. Dumbed if I don't go straight to town and buy another one. Yes, be dad, I'll buy two. In the meantime, Danny milked, fed, and watered the cattle, and Jimmy picked up the pail of milk and carried it to the house. Danny came by the woodpile and brought in a heavy load. Then they washed and sat down to supper. "'Seems to me you look unusually perky,' said Jimmy to his wife. "'Had any good news?' "'Splendid,' said Mary. "'I am so glad, and I don't believe you two stupids know.' "'You never can tell by looking at me what I know,' said Jimmy. "'When I look the wisest, I know the least. "'When I look like a fool, I'm thinking like a philosopher.' "'Give it up,' said Danny promptly. "'You would not catch him knowing anything it would make Mary's eyes shine to tell.' "'Sap is running,' announced Mary. "'The devil you say!' cried Jimmy. "'It is,' beamed Mary. "'It will be full in three days. "'Didn't you notice how green the maples are? "'I took a little walk down to the bottom today. "'I never in all my life was so tired of winter, "'and the first thing I saw was that wet look on the maples, "'and on the low land where they are sheltered and yet get the sun, "'several of them are oozing.' grand cried danny jimmy we must peel those rats in a hurry and then clean the spiles and see how many new ones we will need tomorrow we must come for the traps early and look up our troughs oh for pity's sake don't pile up work enough to kill a horse cried jimmy ain't you ever happy unless you are working yes said danny sometimes i find a book that suits me and sometimes the fish bite and sometimes it's in the air get the condenser said jimmy and that reminds me mary danny spelled spring in the air today well, what if he did? questioned Mary. I can always smell it. A little later, when the sap begins to run in all the trees, and the buds swell, and the ice breaks up, and the wild geese go over, I always scent spring. And when the catkins bloom, then it comes strong, and I just love it. Spring is my happiest time. I have more news, too. Don't spring so much at once, cried Jimmy. You'll spoil my appetite. I guess there's no danger, replied Mary. There is, said Jimmy, at last in the fore section. Appa is French and means eaten tight is irish and means drinkin appetite means ain't and drinkin together tight means drinkin without ain see i was just going to mention it myself said mary it's where you come in strong there's no danger of anybody spoilin your drinkin if they could interfere with your ain you guess danny the dominic hen is setting ventured danny and mary's face showed that he had blundered onto the truth she is affirmed mary pouring the tea but it's real main of you to guess it when i've so few things to tell she's been set in two days and she went over fifteen fresh eggs today in just twenty-one days i will have fifteen the cunningest little chickens you ever saw and there is more yet i found the nest of the gray goose and there are three big eggs in it all buried in feathers she must have stripped her breast almost bare to cover them and i'm the happiest i've been all winter i hate the long lonely shut-in time i am going on a delightful spree i shall help boil down sugar water and make maple syrup i shall set hens and geese and turkeys i shall make soap and clean house and plant seed and all my flowers will bloom again goody for summer it can't come too soon to suit me lord i don't see what there is in any of those things said jimmy i've got just one sign of spring that interests me if you want to see me caper somebody mentioned to me the first rattle of the kingfisher when he comes home the house cleans in his tunnel in the embankment and takes possession of his stump in the river the next day the black bass locates in the deep water below the shoals then you can count me in there is where business begins for jimmy boy i am going to have that bass this summer if i don't plant an acre of corn i bet you that's the truth said mary so quickly that both men laughed ahem said danny then i will have to do my plowing by a head like so i can fish as much as you do in the daytime I hereby make, enact, and enforce a law that neither of us is to fish in the bass hole when the other is not there to fish also. That is the only fair way. I've as much wreck to him as you have. Of course, said Mary, that is a fair way. Make that rule and cape it. If you both fish at once, it's got to be a fair catch for the one that lands it. But whoever catches it, I shall aid it. So it don't matter much to me. You ate it, howled Jimmy. I guess not. Not a taste of that fish. When he's teased me for years, he's as big as a whale. If Jonah had had the good fortune of falling in the Wabash and being swallowed by the black bass, he could have ridden from Peru to Terre Haute and suffered no inconvenience making a landing. Seven pounds he'll weigh by the steel yard, I wager you. 
Five, Jimmy, five, corrected Danny. Seven, shouted Jimmy. Ain't I hooked him repeated? Ain't I seen him broadside? I wonder if them dumb lines of mine have gone and rotted. He left his supper, carrying his chair, and standing on it he began rummaging the top shelf of the cupboard for his box of tackle. He knocked a bottle from the shelf, but caught it in midair with a dexterous sweep. "'Spirits are a-movin,' cried Jimmy, as he restored the camphor to its place. He carried the box to the window, and became so deeply engrossed in its contents that he did not notice when Danny picked up his rat-bag and told him to come on and help skin their day's catch. Mary tried to send him, and he was going in a minute, but the minute stretched and stretched, and both of them were surprised when the door opened and Danny entered with an armload of spiles, and the rat skinnin' was all over. So Jimmy went on unwinding lines and sharpening hooks and talking fish, while Danny and Mary cleaned the spiles and figured out how many new elders must be cut and prepared for more on the morrow, and planned the sugar making. When it was bedtime and Danny had gone and Jimmy and Mary had closed their cabin for the night, Mary stepped to the window that looked on Danny's home to see if his light was burning. It was, and in clear ray stood Danny, stripping yard after yard of fine line through his fingers and carefully examining it. Jimmy came and stood beside her as she wondered. Why, the dumb son of the rainbow, he cried, if he ain't testing his fish lines. The next day Mary Malone was rejoicing when the men returned from trapping and gathering and cleaning the sugar water troughs. There had been a robin at the well. Cape your eye on Mary, advised Jimmy. If she ain't watched close from this time on, she'll be setting hens in snowdrifts and pouring billin' water on the daffodils to sprout them. On the first of March five killdeers flew over in a flock, and a half hour later one straggler crying piteously followed in their wake. Oh, the main things, almost sobbed Mary. Why don't they wait for it? She stood by a big kettle of boiling syrup at the sugar camp, and almost helpless in Jimmy's boots and Danny's great coat. Jimmy cut and carried wood, and Danny hauled sap. All the woods were stirred by the smell of the curling smoke and the odor of the boiling sap, fine as the fragrance of flowers. Bright-eyed deer mice peeped at her from under old logs. The chickadees, nuthatches, and jays started an investigating committee to learn if anything interesting to them was occurring. One gaily dressed little sapsucker hammered a tree nearby and scolded vigorously. "'Right you are,' said Mary. "'It's a pity you're not big enough to drive us from the woods, for into one kettle goes enough sap to last you a lifetime.' The squirrels were sure it was an intrusion, and raced among the branches overhead, barking loud defiance. At night the three rode home on the sled, with syrup jugs beside them, and Mary's apron was filled with big green rolls of pungent woolly dog moss. Jimmy built the fires, Danny fed the stock, and Mary cooked the supper. When it was over, while the men warmed chilled feet and fingers by the fire, Mary poured some syrup into a kettle, and just as it was sugared off, she dipped streams of the amber sweetness into cups of water. All of them ate it like big children, and oh, but it was good. Two days more of the same work ended sugar-making, but for the next three days Danny gathered the rapidly diminishing sap for the vinegar barrel. Then there were more hens ready to set. Water must be poured hourly into the ash hopper to start the flow of lye for soap making. And the smokehouse must be gotten ready to cure the hams and pickled meats so that they would keep during the warm weather. The bluebells were pushing through the sod in a race with the Easter and star flowers. One morning Mary aroused Jimmy with a pull at his arm. Jimmy, Jimmy, she cried, wake up. Do you mean wake up or get up? asked Jimmy sleepily. Both, cried Mary, the larks are here. A little later, Jimmy shouted from the back door to the barn, "'Danny, do you hear the larks?' "'You bet I do,' answered Danny. "'Heard and going over in the night. "'How long is it now till the kingfisher comes?' "'Just a little while,' said Jimmy. "'If only these March storms would let up instead of down. "'He can't come until he can fish, you know. "'He's got to have crabs and minis to live on.' A few days later, the green hylas began to pipe in the swamps. The bullfrogs drummed among the pools in the bottom, the doves cooed in the thickets, and the breath of spring was in the nostrils of all creation, for the wind was heavy with the pungent odors of catkin pollen. The spring flowers were two inches high. The peonies and rhubarb were pushing bright yellow and red cones through the earth. The old gander, leading his flock along the wabash, had hailed passing flocks bound northward until he was hoarse, and the Brahma rooster had threshed the yellow dorkin until he took refuge under the pig pen and dare not stick out his unprotected head. The doors had stood open at supper time, and Danny stayed up late, mending and oiling the harness. Jimmy sat by, cleaning his gun, for to his mortification he had that day missed killing a crow which stole from the ash-hopper the egg with which Mary tested the strength of the lie. 
in a basket behind the kitchen stove fifteen newly hatched yellow chickens with brown stripes on their backs were peeping and nestling and on wing the killdeers cried half the night at two o'clock in the morning came a tap on the malone's bedroom window danny questioned mary half startled tell jimmy cried danny's breathless voice outside tell him the kingfisher has just struck the river jimmy sat straight up in bed then glory be he cried tomorrow the black bass comes home end of chapter four at the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter chapter 5 when the rainbow set its arch in the sky where did jimmy go asked mary jimmy had been up in time to feed the chickens and carry in the milk but he disappeared shortly after breakfast Danny almost blushed as he answered. He went to take a peep at the river. It's going down fast. When it gets into its regular channel, spawning will be over and the fish will come back to their old places. We figure that the black bass will be home today. When you go digging for bait, said Mary, I wonder if the two of you could make it convenient to spade an onion bed. If I had it spaded, I could stick the sets myself. Now that am a fair, Mary said Danny. We never went fishing till the garden was made, and the crops at least wouldn't have suffer. We'll make the beds, of course, just as soon as they can be spaded, and plant the seed, too. I want to plant the seeds myself, said Mary. And we didn't want you should, replied Danny. All we want you to do is to boss. But I'm going to do the planting myself. Mary was emphatic. It will be good for me to be in the sunshine, and I do enjoy working in the dirt, so that for a little while I'm happy if you want to put the onions in the highest place i should think i could spade and bed now and enough for lettuce and radishes danny went after a spade and mary malone laughed softly as she saw that he also carried an old tin can he tested the earth in several places and then called to her all right mary ground in prime shape turns up dry and mellow we will have the garden started in no time he had spaded but a minute when mary saw him run past the window leap the fence and go hurrying down the path to the river she went to the door at the head of the lane stood Jimmy, waving his hat, and the fresh morning air carried his cry clearly. Gee, Danny, come hear him splash! Just why that cry, in the sight of Danny McNown racing toward the river, his spade lying on the upturned earth of her scarcely begun onion bed, should have made her angry, it would be hard to explain. He had no tackle or bait, and reason easily could have told her that he would return shortly, and finish anything she wanted done. But when was a lonely, disappointed woman ever reasonable? she set the dishwater on the stove wiped her hands on her apron and walking to the garden picked up the spade and began turning great pieces of earth she had never done rough farm work such as all women about her did she had little exercise during the long cold winter and the first half dozen spadefuls tired her until the tears of self-pity rolled i wish there was a turtle as big as a wash tub in the river she sobbed and i wish it would eat that old black bass to the last scale and i'm going to take the shotgun and go over to the embankment and poke it into the tunnel and blow the old kingfisher through into the cornfield then maybe danny won't go off too and leave me i want this onion bed spaded right away so i do drop that idiot what are you doing yelled jimmy mary you goose panted danny as he came hurrying across the yard what do you mean you knew i'd be back in a minute Jimmy just called me to hear the bass splash. I was coming back. Mary, this am an affair. Danny took the spade from her hand, and Mary fled sobbing to the house. What's the row? demanded Jimmy of the suffering Danny. I just started spading this onion bed, explained Danny. Of course she thought we were going to stay all day. With no poles, and no bait, and no grub? She didn't think any such a dumb thing, said Jimmy. You don't know women. She just got to the place where it's her time to spill brine and raise a rumpus about something, and Aisy Brathen would start her. Just let her ball it out, and then we'll get something decent for dinner. Danny turned a spade full of earth and broke it open, and Jimmy squatted by the can and began picking out the angleworms. I see where we didn't fish much this summer, said Danny as he waited, and where we fish close to home when we do, and where all the work is done before we go. Ah, borrow me rose-colored specks, cried Jimmy. I don't see anything but what I've always seen. I'll come and go as I please, and Mary can do the same. I don't throw no Jiminy fit every time a woman acts the fool a little, and if you've lived with one fifteen years, you wouldn't either. Of course we'll make the garden. Wish to goodness it was a beer garden. What I wouldn't like to plant a lot of hop seeds and see rose little green beer bottles humping up the dirt. Oh, my, what all does she want done? Danny turned another spadeful of earth and studied the premises while Jimmy gathered the worms. 
palin's all on the fence asked danny yep said jimmy well the yard is to be raked yep the flower bed spaded yep stones around the peonies flocks and hollyhocks raised and manure worked in all the trees must be pruned the bushes and vines trimmed and the gooseberries currants and raspberries thinned the strawberry bed must be fixed up and the rhubarb and asparagus spaded around and manured this whole garden must be made and the road swept and the gate sandpapered and the barn whitewashed return to grazing nebuchadnezzar said jimmy we do what's reasonable and then we go fishing see three beds spaded squared and ready for seed and lay in the warm spring sunshine before noon jimmy raked the yard and danny trimmed the gooseberries then he wheeled a barrel of swamp loam for a flower bed by the cabin wall and listened intently between each shovelful he threw he could not hear a sound what was more he could not bear it he went to jimmy say jimmy he said didn't you have to go in for a drink house or town inquired jimmy sweetly the house exploded danny i didn't hear a sound yet you go in for a drink and tell mary i want to know where she'd like the new flower bed she's been talking about jimmy leaned the rake against the tree and started and jimmy said danny if she's quit crying ask her what was the matter i want to know jimmy vanished presently he passed danny where he worked come on whispered jimmy the bewildered danny followed jimmy passed the woodpile and pig pen and slunk around behind the barn where he leaned against the logs and held his sides danny stared at him she says wheezed jimmy that she guesses she wanted to go and hear the bass splash too danny's mouth fell open and then closed with a snap us for the fool killer he said you didn't let her see you laugh let her see me laugh cried jimmy let her see me laugh i told her she wasn't to go for a few days yet because we were sawing the kingfisher stump into a rustic sate for her and we were going to carry her out to it and she was to sit there and sew and up pyre the fishin in whichever bait she told the bass to take that one of us would be getting it and she was pleased as anything me lad now it's up to us to rig up some sort of dacent sate and tag a woman along half the time you thick-tongued descendant of a bagpipe baboon what did you send me in there for maybe a little of it will tire her groaned danny it will if she undertakes to follow me jimmy said i know where horse weeds grow giraffe high then they went back to work and presently many savory odors began to steal from the cabin whereat jimmy looked at danny and winked and i told you so wink a garden grows fast under the hands of two strong men really working and by the time the first slice of sugar-cured ham from the smokehouse for that season struck the sizzle and skillet and mary very meekly called from the back door to know if one of them wanted to dig a little horseradish the garden was almost ready for planting then they went into the cabin and ate fragrant thick slices of juicy fried ham seasoned with horseradish fried eggs freckled with the ham fat in which they were cooked fluffy mashed potatoes with a little well of melted butter in the center of the mound overflowing the sides raisin pie soda biscuit and their own maple syrup oh mo oh, said jimmy i don't know as i hanker for city life so much as i sometimes think i do what do you suppose the adulterated stuff we read about in papers tastes like i've often wondered answered danny look at some of the hogs and cattle that we see shipped from here to city markets the folks that sell them would starve before they'd eat a bit of them and yet somebody eats them and what do you suppose maple syrup made from hickory bark and brown sugar tastes like and cold storage eggs and cottonseed butter and even horseradish half turnip added mary bait up the cream a little before you put it in your coffee or it will be in lumps when the cattle are on clover it raises so thick jimmy speared a piece of salt rising bread crust soaked in ham gravy made with cream and said i wish i could bring that third man home with me to one meal of the real thing next time he strikes town i believe he would enjoy it may i mary mary's face flushed slightly depends on when he comes she said of course if i am cleaning house or busy with something i can't put off sure cried jimmy i'd ask you before i brought him because i'd want him to have something special some of this ham and horseradish and maple syrup to begin with and then your fried spring chicken and your stewed squirrel is a drain mary nobody ever makes turtle soup half so rich as yours and your green peas and cream and asparagus on toast is a revelation don't you remember twas father michael that said that i ought to be able to find mushrooms in a few weeks and i can taste your rhubarb pie over from last year gee but i wish you'd come in strawberrying berries from the vines butter in the crust cream you have to bait to make it smooth talk about shortcake what's wrong with cherry cobbler asked danny or blackberry pie or greens cooked with bacon or chicken pie or catfish rolled in cornmeal and fried in ham fat or guineas stewed in cream with hard-boiled eggs in the gravy 
oh stop cried the delighted mary it makes me dead tired thinking how i'll ever be cooking all you want sure have him come and both of you can pick out the things you like the best and i'll fix them for him pure fresh stuff might be a trait to a city man when dolan took sister katie to new york with him his boss sent them to a five dollar a day house and they thought they was some up by the third day poor katie was crying for a square meal she couldn't touch the butter the eggs made her sick and the cold storage meat and chicken never got nearer her stomach than her nose so she just ate fish because they were fresh and she ate and she ate till if you mention new york to poor katie she turns pale and tastes fish she vows and declares that she feeds her chickens and hogs better food twice a day than the people fed her in new york i'll bet my new milk pail the grub we eat every day would be a treat that would raise him said jimmy provided his taste ain't so depraved with saltpeter and chalk he don't know fresh pure food when he tastes it i understand some of the victims really don't your new milk pail questioned mary that's what said jimmy the next time i go to town i'm going to get you two but i only need one protested mary instead of two get me a new dishpan mine leaks and smears the stove and table by gorry sighed jimmy there goes me tongue lettin me in for it again i'll look over the skins and if any of them are ripe i'll get you a milk pail and a dish pan the next time i go into town and by gee if that dandy big coon hide i got last fall looks good i'm going to comb it up and work the skin fine and send it over to the thrid man with me compliments i don't feel right about him yet wonder what his name really is and where he lives and whether i killed him complete and dry goods man in town can tell you said danny ask the clerk in the hotel suggested mary you've said it cried jimmy that's the stuff and i can find out when he'll be here again two hours more they faithfully worked on the garden and then jimmy began to grow restless ah go on cried mary you have done all that is needed just now and more too there won't any fish bite to-day but you can have the pleasure of stringing them poor suffering worms on a hook and soaking them in the river suffering worms suffering job cried jimmy what's next go on danny get your pole Danny went. As he came back, Jimmy was sprinkling a thin layer of earth over the bait in the can. Why not come along, Mary? he suggested. I'm not done planting my seed, she said. I'll be tired when I am, and I thought the place wasn't fixed for me yet. We can't fix that till a little later, said Jimmy. We can't tell where it's going to be grassy and shady yet, and the wood is too wet to fix a seat. Any kind of seat will do, said Mary. I guess you better not try to make one out of the kingfisher stump. If you take it out, it may change the pool and drive away the bass sure cried jimmy what a head you've got we'll have to find some other stump for a sate i don't want to go until it gets dry underfoot and warmer said mary you boys go on i'll tell you when i'm ready to go there said jimmy when well on the way to the river what did i tell you won't go if she has the chance just wants to be asked i didn't pretend to know women said danny gravely but whatever mary does is all wrecked with me so i've observed remarked jimmy now how will we get at this fishing to be perfectly fair tell you what i think said danny i think we ought to pick out the twa best places about the black bass pool and you take and fray yours and i'll take the other for mine and then we'll each fish from his own place nothing fair about that answered jimmy you might just happen to strike the bed where he lays most and be getting bites all the time and mean none or i might strike it and you be left out and then there's days when the wind has to do and the light we ought to change places every hour there's nothing fair in that either broke in danny i might have told up to my place and just be feeding him my bait and here you'd come along and prove by your watch that my time was up and take him when i had him all ready to bite that's so for you hurried in jimmy i'd be hanged if i'd leave a place by the watch when i had a strike me either said danny tis past human nature to ask it i'll tell you what we'll do we'll go to work and rig up a sort of bridge where it's so narrow and shallow just above kingfisher shoals and then we'll toss up for sides then each will keep to his side with a decent pole either of us can throw across the pool and both of us can fish as we please then each fellow can pick his bait and cast or fish deep as he thinks best what do you say to that i don't see how anything could be fairer than that said jimmy but i don't want to fish for anything but the bass i'm going back and get our rubber boots and you'll be rolling logs and we'll build that crossing right now all right said danny so they laid aside their poles and tackle and danny rolled logs and gathered material for the bridge while jimmy went back after their boots then both of them entered the water and began clearing away drift and laying the foundations as the first log of the crossing lifted above the water danny paused how about the kingfisher he asked when did this scare him away not if he ain't a dumb fool said jimmy and if he is let him go seems like the river would no be just ricked without him said danny breaking off a spice limb and nibbling the fragrant buds let's only use what we bear need to get across 
and where will we fix for mary oh get out said jimmy i ain't gonna fool with that well we best fix a place then we can tell her we fixed it and it's all ready sure cried jimmy you are catching it from your neighbor tell her a place is all fixed and waiting and you couldn't a drag her here with a team of oxen tell her you are gonna fix it soon and she'll come to see if you've done it if she has to be carried on a stretcher so they selected a spot that they thought would be all right for mary and not close enough to disturb the bass and the kingfisher rolled out two logs and fished a board that had been carried by a fresh ship from the water and laid it across them and decided that would have to serve until they could do better then they sat astride the board danny drew out a coin and they tossed it to see which was heads and tails danny won heads then they tossed to see which bank was heads or tails and the right which was on rainbow side came to heads so jimmy was to use the bridge then they went home and began the night work the first thing jimmy espied was the barrel containing the milk pail he fished out the pail and while danny fed the stock shoveled manure and milked jimmy pounded out the dents closed the bullet holes emptied the bait into it half filled it with mellow earth and went to mary for some cornmeal to sprinkle on top to feed the worms at four o'clock the next morning danny was up feeding milking scraping plows and setting bolts after breakfast they piled their implements on a mud boat which danny drove while jimmy rode one of his team and led the other and opened the gates they began on danny's field because it was closest and for the next two weeks unless it were too rainy to work they plowed harrowed lined off and planted the seed the blackbirds followed along the furrows picking up grubs the crows cawed from high tree tops the bluebirds twittered about hollow stumps and fence rails the wood thrushes sang out their souls in the thickets across the river and the king cardinal of rainbow bottom whistled to split his throat from the giant sycamore tender greens were showing along the river and in the fields and the purple of red bud mingled with the white of wild plum all along the wabash the sunny side of the hill that sloped down to rainbow bottom was a mass of spring beauties anemones and violets thread-like ramps rose rank to the scent among them and round ginger leaves were thrusting their folded heads through the mold the kingfisher was cleaning his house and fishing from his favorite stump in the river while near him at the fall of every luckless worm that missed its hold on a blossomed whitened thorn tree came the splash of the great black bass every morning the bass took a trip around horseshoe bend food hunting and the small fry raced for life before his big shear-like jaws during the heat of noon he lay in the deep pool below the stump and rested but when evening came he set out in search of supper and frequently he felt so good that he leaped clear of the water and fell back in with a splash that threw shining spray about him or lashed out with his tail and sent widening circles of waves rolling from his lurking place then the kingfisher rattled with all his might and flew for the tunnel in the embankment some of these days the air was still the earth warmed in the golden sunshine and murmured a low song of sleepy content some days the wind raised whirling dead leaves before it and covering the earth with drifts of plum cherry and apple bloom like late falling snow then great black clouds came sweeping across the sky and massed above rainbow bottom the lightning flashed as if the heavens were being cracked open and the rolling thunder set terror to the hearts of man and beast when the birds flew for shelter danny and jimmy unhitched their horses and raced for the stables to escape the storm and to be with mary whom electricity made nervous they would sit on the little front porch and watch the greedy earth drink the downpour they could almost see the grass and flowers grow when the clouds scattered the thunder grew fainter and the sun shone again between light sprinkles of rain then a great glittering rainbow set its arch in the sky and it planted one of its feet in horseshoe bend and the other so far away they could not even guess where if it rained lightly in a little while danny and jimmy could go back to their work afield if the downpour was heavy and made plowing impossible they pulled weeds and hoed in the garden danny discoursed on the wholesome freshness of the earth and jimmy ever waited a chance to twist his words and ring in a laugh on him he usually found it sometimes after a rain they took their bait cans and rods and went down to the river to fish if one could not go the other religiously refrained from casting bait into the pool where the black bass lay once when they were fishing together the bass rose to a white moth skittered over the surface by danny late in the evening and twice jimmy had strikes which he averred had taken the arm almost off him but neither really had the bass on his hook they kept to their own land and fished when they pleased for game laws and wardens were unknown to them truth to tell neither of them really hoped to get the bass before fall the water was too high in the spring minnows were plentiful and as jimmy said it seemed as if the dom plum tree just rained caterpillars so they bided their time and the signs prohibiting trespass on all sides of their land were many and emphatic and mary had instructions to ring the dinner bell if she caught sight of any strangers the days grew longer and the sun was insistent 
untold miles they trudged back and forth across their land guiding their horses jerked about with plows their feet weighted with the damp clinging earth and their clothing pasted to their wet bodies jimmy was growing restless never in all his life had he worked so faithfully as that spring and never had his visits to casey's so told on him no matter where they started or how hard they worked danny was across the middle of the field and helping jimmy before the finish it was always danny who plowed on while jimmy rode to town for the missing bolt or buckle and he generally rolled from his horse into a fence corner and slept the remainder of the day on his return the work and heat were beginning to tire him and his trips to casey's had been much less frequent than he desired he grew to feel that between them danny and mary were driving him and a desire to balk at a slight cause gathered in his breast he deliberately tied his team in a fence corner lay down and fell asleep the clanging of the supper bell aroused him he opened his eyes and as he rose found that danny had been to the barn and had brought a horse blanket to cover him well as he knew anything jimmy knew that he had no business sleeping in fence corners so early in the season with candor he would have admitted to himself that a part of his brittle temper came from aching bones and rheumatic twinges some way the sight of danny swinging across the field looking as fresh as in the early morning and the fact that he had carried a blanket to cover him and the further fact that he was wild for drink and could think of no excuse on earth for going to town brought him to a fighting crisis danny turned his horses at jimmy's feet come on jimmy supper bell is rung he cried we mustn't keep mary waiting she wants us to help her plant the sweet potatoes to nicked jimmy rose and his joints almost creaked the pain angered him he leaned forward and glared at danny is there one minute of the day when you ain't thinking about my wife he demanded oh so slowly and so ugly danny met his hateful gaze squarely not a minute he answered except when i am thinking about you the hell you say exploded the astonished jimmy danny stepped out of the furrow and came closer see here jimmy malone he said you ain't forgot the nicked when i told you i loved mary with all of my heart and that i'd never love another woman i sent you to tell her for me and to ask if i might come to her and you brought me her answer it's not your fault she preferred you everybody did but it is your fault that i've stayed on here i tried to go and you wouldn't let me so for fifteen years you have lain with the woman i love and i've lain alone a few rods of you if that ain't man hell try some other on me and see if it will touch me i sent you to tell her that i loved her have i ever sent you to tell her that i've quit i should think you'd know by this time that i'm not a quitter love her why i love her till i can see her standin plain before me when i know she's a mile away love her why i can smell her any place i am sweeter than any flower i ever held to my face love her till the day i dee i love her but it ain't any fault of yours and if you've come to the place where i worry you that's the place where i go as i wanted to on the same day you brought mary to rainbow bottom jimmy's gray jaws fell open jimmy's sullen eyes cleared he caught danny by the arm for the love of heaven what did i say danny he panted i must have been half asleep go you go you leave rainbow bottom then by god i go too i won't stay here without you not a day if i had to take my choice between you i'd give up mary before i'd give up the best friend i ever had go i guess not unless i go with you she can go to jimmy jimmy cautioned danny i mean every dumb word of it said jimmy i think more of you than i ever did of any woman Danny drew a deep breath. Then why, in the name of God, did you say that thing to me? I have not betrayed your trust in me, not ever, Jimmy, and you know it. What's the matter with you? Jimmy heaved a deep sigh and rubbed his hands across his hot, angry face. Oh, I'm just so dumb sore, he said. Some days I get about wild. Things haven't come out like I thought they would. Jimmy, if you're in trouble, why do you not tell me? Can I help you? Haven't I always helped you if I could? yes you have said jimmy always been a thousand times too good to me but you can't help here i'm up again it alone but put this in your pipe and smoke it good and brown if you go i go i don't stay here without you then it's up to you not to make it impossible for me to stay said danny after this i'll try to be careful i've had no guard on my lips i've said whatever came into my head the supper bell clanged sharply a second time that means more heaven on the wabash said jimmy wish i had a bracer before i face it how long has it been jimmy asked danny eternity replied jimmy briefly danny stood thinking and then light broke jimmy was always short of money in the summer when trappin was over and before any crops were ready he was usually out of funds danny hesitated then he said would a small loan be what you need jimmy jimmy's eyes gleamed it would put new life into me he cried forgive me danny i am almost crazy danny handed over a coin and after supper jimmy went to town 
then danny saw his mistake he had purchased peace for himself but what about mary end of chapter five Chapter Six of At the Foot of the Rainbow by Gene Stratton Porter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Six The Heart of Mary Malone. This is the job that was done with the Reaper. If we hustle, we can do it ourselves, thus securing to us. A little cheaper, the bread and pie upon our pantry shelves. Eat this wheat, by and by, on this beautiful Wabash shore. Drink this rye, by and by, eat and drink on this beautiful shore. So sang Jimmy as he drove through the wheat, oats, and rye, accompanied by the clacking machinery. Danny stopped stacking sheaves to mop his warm, perspiring face, and to listen. Jimmy, always with an eye to the effect he was producing, immediately broke into a wilder parody. Drive this mower a little slower on this beautiful Wabash shore. Cutting wheat to buy our meat, cutting oats to buy our coats. Also pants, if we get the chance, by and by we'll cut the rye. But I bet my hat I drink that, I drink that, drive this mower a little slower, in the sweet, in the sweet, by and by. The larks scolded, fluttering overhead, for at times the reaper overtook their belated broods. The bobolinks danced and chattered on stumps and fences, in an agony of suspense, when their nests were approached and cried pitifully if they were destroyed. The chewinks flashed from the ground to the fences and trees and back, crying, Chewink! Chewee! to each other, in such excitement that they appeared to be in danger of flirting off their long tails. The quail ran about the shorn fields and excitedly called from fence riders to draw their flocks into the security of Rainbow Bottom. Frightened hares bounded through the wheat, and if the cruel blade sheared into their nests, Danny gathered the wounded and helpless of the scattered broods in his hat and carried them to Mary. Then came threshing, which was a busy time, but after that, through the long, hot days of late July and August, there was little to do afield, and fishing was impossible. Danny grubbed fence corners, mended fences, chopped and corded wood for winter, and, in spare time, read his books. For the most part, Jemmy kept close to Danny. Jemmy's temper never had been so variable. Danny was greatly troubled, for despite Jemmy's protests of devotion, he flared at a word, and sometimes at no word at all. The only thing in which he really seemed interested was the coonskin he was dressing to send to Boston. Over that he worked by the hour, sometimes with earnest face, and sometimes he raised his head and let out a whoop that almost frightened Mary. At such times, he was sure to go on and give her some new detail of the hunt for the fifty coons that he had forgotten to tell her before. He had been to the hotel and learned the thread man's name and address, and found that he did not come regularly, and no one knew when to expect him, so that when he had combed and brushed the fur to its finest point, and worked the skin until it was velvet soft, and bleached it until it was muslin white, he made it into a neat package and sent it with his compliments to the Boston man. After he had waited for a week, he began going to town every day to the post office for the letter he expected, and coming home much worse for a visit to Casey's. Since plowing time, he had asked Danny for money, as he wanted it, telling him to keep an account, and he would pay him in the fall. He seemed to forget, or not to know, how fast his bills grew. Then came a week in August, when the heat invaded even the cool retreat along the river. Out of the highway, passing wheels rolled back the dust like water, and raised it in clouds after them. The ragweeds hung wilted heads along the road. The goldenrod and purple ironwort 
were dust-colored and dust-choked. The trees were thirsty, and their leaves shriveling. The riverbed was bare its width in places, and while the kingfisher made merry with his family and rattled, feasting from Abram Johnson's to the gar hole, the black bass sought its deep pool and lay still. It was a rare thing to hear it splash in those days. The prickly heat burned until the souls of men were tried. Mary slipped listlessly about or lay much of the time on a couch beside a window where a breath of air stirred. Despite the good beginning he had made in the spring, Jimmy slumped with the heat and exposures he had risked and was hard to live with. Danny was not having a good time himself. Since Jimmy's wedding, life had been all grind to Danny, but he kept his reason, accepted his lot, and ground his grist with patience and such cheer as few men could have summoned to the aid of so poor a cause. Had there been anyone to notice it, Danny was tired and heat-ridden also, but, as always, Danny sank self and labored uncomplainingly with Jimmy's problems. On a burning August morning, Danny went to breakfast and found Mary white and nervous, little prepared to eat, and no sign of Jimmy. Jimmy sleeping? he asked. I don't know what Jimmy is, Mary answered coldly. Since when? asked Danny, gulping coffee and taking hasty bites, for he had begun his breakfast supposing that Jimmy would come presently. He left as soon as you went home last night, she said, and he has not come back yet. Danny did not know what to say, loyal to the bone to Jimmy, loving each hair on the head of Mary Malone, and she worn and neglected. The problem was heartbreaking in any solution he attempted, and he felt none too well himself. He arose hastily, muttering something about getting the work done. He brought in wood and water, and asked if there was anything more he could do. "'Sure,' said Mary, in a calm, even voice. "'Go to the barn and shovel manure for Jimmy Malone, and do all the work he shirks, before you do anything for yourself.' Danny always had admitted that he did not understand women, but he understood a plain danger signal, and he almost ran from the cabin. In the fear that Mary might think he had heeded her hasty words, he went to his own barn first, just to show her that he did not do Jimmy's work. The flies and mosquitoes were so bad he kept his horses stabled through the day, and turned them to pasture at night, so their stalls were to be cleaned, and he set to work. When he had finished his own barn, as he had nothing else to do, he went on to Jimmy's. He had finished the stalls and was sweeping when he heard a sound at the back door, and turning, saw Jimmy clinging to the casing, unable to stand longer. Danny sprang to him and helped him inside. Jimmy sank to the floor. Danny caught up several empty grain sacks, folded them, and pushed them under Jimmy's head for a pillow. Danish, did you say your national flourish wash shisel? asked Jimmy. Yes, said Danny, lifting the heavy auburn head to smooth the folds from the sacks. Why is she like me? I don't know, answered Danny wearily. Awful jaggish on, murmured Jimmy, sighed heavily, and was off. His clothing was torn and dust-covered. His face was purple and bloated, and his hair was dusty and disordered. He was a repulsive sight. As Danny straightened Jimmy's limbs, he thought he heard a step. He lifted his head and leaned forward to listen. "'Danny McNall called the same even, cold voice he had heard at breakfast. "'Have you left me, too?' Danny sprang for a manger. He caught a great armload of hay and threw it over Jimmy. He gave one hurried toss to scatter it, for Mary was in the barn. As he turned to interpose his body between her and the manger, which partially screened Jimmy. His heart sickened. He was too late. She had seen. Frightened to the soul, he stared at her. She came a step closer, and with her foot gave a hand of Jimmy's that lay exposed a contemptuous shove. 
you didn't get him completely covered she said how long have you had him here danny was frightened into speech not a minute mary he just came in when i heard ye i was trying to spare ye him you mean she said in that same strange voice i suppose you gave him money and he has a bottle and he's been here all night mary said danny that's not true i have furnished him money he'd mortgage the farm or do something worse if i didn't but i dunno where he has been all night and in trying to cover him my only thought was to save your pain and when you let him spend money you know you'll never get back and loaf while you do his work and when you lie mountain high times without number who is it for then fifteen years restraint slid from danny like a cloak and in the torture of his soul his slow tongue outran all its previous history ye he shouted it's for jimmy too but ye first always ye first mary began to tremble her white cheeks burned red her figure straightened and her hands clenched on the cross will you swear it she cried on the sacred body of jesus himself if i could face him answered danny anything everything is fried first mary then why she panted between gasps for breath tell me why if you have cared for me enough to stay here all these years and see that i had the best treatment you could get for me why didn't you care for me enough more to save me this oh danny tell me why and then she shook with strangled sobs until she scarce could stand alone danny macnon cleared the space between them and took her in his arms her trembling hands clung to him her head dropped on his breast and the perfume of her hair in his nostrils drove him mad then the tense bulk of her body struck against him and horror filled his soul one second he held her the next jimmy smothering under the hay threw up an arm and called like a petulant child danny make shun quick shinish my fish and danny awoke to the realization that mary was another man's and that man one who trusted him completely the problem was so much too big for poor Danny that reason kindly slipped a cog. He broke from the grasp of the woman, fled through the back door, and took to the woods. He ran as if fiends were after him, and he ran and ran. And when he could run no longer, he walked, but he went on, just on and on. He crossed forests and fields, orchards and highways, streams and rivers, deep woods and swamps and on and on he went he felt nothing and saw nothing and thought nothing save to go on always on in the dark he stumbled on and through the day he staggered on and he stopped for nothing save at times to lift water to his parched lips the bushes took his hat the thorns ripped his shirt the water soaked his shoes and they spread, and his feet came through, and the stones cut them until they bled. Leaves and twigs stuck in his hair, and his eyes grew bloodshot, his lips and tongue swollen, and when he could go no further on his feet, he crawled on his knees, until at last he pitched forward on his face and lay still. The tumult was over, and Mother Nature set to work to see about repairing damages. Danny was so badly damaged, soul heart and body that she never would have been equal to the task but another woman happened that way and she helped danny was carried to a house and a doctor dressed his hurts when the physician got down to first principles and found a big white-bodied fine-faced scotchman in the heart of the wreck he was amazed a wild man but not a whiskey bloat a crazy man but not a maniac he stood long beside Danny as he lay unconscious. 
I'll take oath that man has wronged no one, he said. What in the name of God has some woman been doing to him? He took money from Danny's wallet and bought clothing to replace the rags he had burned. He filled Danny with nourishment and told the woman who found him that when he awoke, if he did not remember, to tell him that his name was Danny McNown and that he lived in Rainbow Bottom, Adams County, because just at that time Danny was halfway across the state. A day later he awoke, in a strange room and among strange faces. He took up life exactly where he left off, and in his ears, as he remembered his flight, rang the awful cry uttered by Mary Malone, and not until then did there come to Danny the realization that she had been driven to seek him for help, because her woman's hour was upon her. Cold fear froze Danny's soul. He went back by railway and walked the train most of the way. He dropped from the cars at the water tank and struck across country, and again he ran. But this time it was no headlong flight. Straight as a homing bird went Danny with all speed toward the foot of the rainbow and Mary Malone. The kingfisher sped, rattling down the river, when Danny came crashing along the bank. Oh, God, let her be alive, prayed Danny as he leaned panting against a tree for an instant, because he was very close now and sickeningly afraid. Then he ran on. In a minute it would be over. At the next turn he could see the cabins. As he dashed along, Jimmy Malone rose from a log and faced him. A white Jimmy with black-ringed eyes and shaking hands. Where the hell have you been? Jimmy demanded. Is she dead? cried Danny. The doctor is talking scare, said Jimmy, but I don't scare so easy. She's never been sick in her life, and she has lived through it twice before. Why should she die now? Of course the kid is dead again, he added angrily. Danny shut his eyes and stood still. He had helped plant star flowers on two tiny cross-marked mounds at Five Mile Hill. Now... There were three. Jimmy had worn out her love for him. That was plain. Why should she die now? To Danny, it seemed that question should have been, why should she live? Jimmy eyed him belligerently. Why in the name of sense did you cut out when I was off me pins? He growled. Of course, I don't blame you for cutting that kind of a party. Me for the woods. All right, but what I can't see is why you couldn't have gone for the doctor and waited until I'd slept it off before you went. I didn't know she was sick, answered Danny. I deserve anything only Anne can say to me, and it's all my fault if she does. But this ain't thing. You got to say you know, right, no, Jimmy. You got to say you know that I didn't understand Mary was sick when I went. Sure, I've said that all the time, agreed Jimmy. But what I don't understand is why you went. I guess she thinks it was her fault. I came out here to try to study it out. The nurse woman, dumb pretty girl, says if you don't get back before midnight, it's all up. You're just on time, Danny. The talk in the house is that she'll wink out if you don't prove to her that she didn't drive you away. She is about crazy over it. What did she do to you? Nothing, exclaimed Danny. She was so deathly sick she did not know what she was doing. I can see it no, but I did not understand then. That's all right said Jimmy. She didn't. She keeps moaning over and over. What did I do? You hustle in and fix it up with her. I'm getting tired of all this racket. All Danny heard was that he was to go to Mary. He went up the lane, across the garden, and stepped in at the back door. Beside the table stood a comely young woman, dressed in blue and white stripes. 
She was doing something with eggs and milk. She glanced at Danny and finished filling a glass. As she held it to the light, Is your name McNon? She inquired. Yes, said Danny. Danny McNon? she asked. Yes, said Danny. Then you are the medicine needed here just now, she said, as if that were the most natural statement in the world. Mrs. Malone seems to have an idea that she offended you and drove you from home just prior to her illness, and as she has been very sick, she is in no condition to bear other trouble. You understand? Do ye understand that I could not have gone if I had known she was ill? asked Danny in turn. From what she has said in delirium, I have been sure of that, replied the nurse. It seems you have been the stay of the family for years. I have a very high opinion of you, Mr. McNaught. Wait until I speak to her. The nurse vanished, presently returned, and as Danny passed through the door, she closed it after him, and he stood still, trying to see in the dim light. That great snowy stretch, that must be the bed. That tumbled dark circle, that must be Mary's hair. That dead white thing beneath it, that must be Mary's face. Those burning lights flaming on him, those must be Mary's eyes. Danny stepped softly across the room and bent over the bed. He tried hard to speak naturally. Mary, he said. Oh, Mary, I did not know ye were ill. Oh, believe me, I did not realize ye were suffering pain. She smiled faintly, and her lips moved. Danny bent lower. Promise, she panted. Promise you will stay now. Her hand fumbled at her breast, and then she slipped on the white cover, a little black cross. Danny knew what she meant. He laid his hand on the emblem precious to her and said softly, I swear I never will leave ye again, Mary Malone. A great light swept into her face, and she smiled happily. Now ye, said Danny. He slipped the cross into her hand. Repeat after me, he said. I promise I will get well, Danny. I promise I will get well, Danny, if I can, said Mary. Na, said Danny, that wanna do. Repeat what I said, and remember it is on the cross. Life has not been right for ye, Mary, but if ye will get well before the Lord, in some way we will make it happier. Ye will get well. I promise I will get well, Danny, said Mary Malone, and Danny softly left the room. Outside he said to the nurse, What can I do? She told him everything of which she could think that would be of benefit. Now tell me all ye know of what happened, commanded Danny. After you left, said the nurse, she was in labor, and she could not waken her husband, and she grew frightened and screamed. There were men passing out on the road. They heard her, and came to see what was the matter. Strangers? shuddered Danny, with dry lips. No neighbors one man went for the nearest woman and the others drove to town for a doctor they had help here almost as soon as you could but of course the shock was a very dreadful thing and the heat of the past few weeks has been enervating on thing more questioned danny why do her children dee i don't know about the others answered the nurse this one simply couldn't be made to breathe. It was a strange thing. It was a fine big baby, a boy, and it seemed perfect. But we couldn't save it. I never worked harder. They told me she had lost two others, and we tried everything of which we could think. It just seemed as if it had grown a lump of flesh, with no vital spark in it. Danny turned, went out of the door, and back along the lane to the river where he had left Jimmy. A lump of flesh with no vital spark in it, he kept repeating. I dunna but that is the secret. She is almost numb with misery. 
All these days she's been without hope, and these awful nights, when she's watched and feared alone, she has no wished to perpetuate him in children who might be like him, and so at their coming the vital spark is not in them. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, have ye Mary's happiness and those three little graves to answer for? He found Jimmy asleep where he had left him. Danny shook him awake. I want to talk with ye, he said. Jimmy sat up and looked into Danny's face. He had a complaint on his lips, but it died there. He tried to apologize. I am almost dead for sleep, he said. There has been no rest for anyone here. What do you think? I think she will live, said Danny dryly. In spite of your neglect and my cowardice, I think she will live to suffer more for us. Jimmy's mouth opened, but for once no sound issued. The drops of perspiration raised on his forehead. Danny sat down, and staring at him, Jimmy saw that there were patches of white hair at his temples that had been brown a week before. His colorless face was sunken almost to the bone, and there was a peculiar twist about his mouth. Jimmy's heart weighed heavily, his tongue stood still, and he was afraid to the marrow in his bones. "'I think she will live,' repeated Danny, "'and about the suffering more. We will face that like men, and see what can be done about it. This makes three little graves on the hill, Jimmy. What do they mean to ye?' "'Dumb bad luck!' said Jimmy promptly. "'Nothing more?' asked Danny. "'No responsibility at all. Ye are the father of those children. Have ye never been to the doctor and asked why ye lost them?' "'No, I haven't,' said Jimmy. "'That is one thing more we will do now,' said Danny, "'and then we will do more, much more.' "'What are you driving at?' asked Jimmy. The secret of Mary's heart, said Danny. The cold sweat ran from the pores of Jimmy's body. He licked his dry lips and pulled his hat over his eyes, that he might watch Danny from under the brim. We are twa big strong men, said Danny. For fifteen years we have lived here with Mary. The night ye married her, the light of happiness went up for me. But I shut my mouth and shouldered my burden, and went on with my best foot first, because if she had not refused me, I should have married her, and then ye would have been the one to suffer. If she had chosen me, I should have married her, just as ye did. Oh, I've never forgotten that. So I have not been a happy man, Jimmy. We wanna go into that any further. We've been over it once. It seems to be a form of torture, especially designed for me, though at times I must confess it seems rough, and I cannot see why, but we'll cut that off with this. Life has been hell's hottest sweatbox for me these fifteen years. Jimmy groaned aloud. Danny's keen gray eyes seemed boring into the soul of the man before him as he went on. Now how about ye? Ye got the girl ye wanted. Ye own a good farm that would make ye a living and save ye money every year. Ye have done just what ye pleased, and as far as I could I have helped ye. I've had my eye on ye pretty close, Jimmy, and if ye are a happy man, I dunno but I'm content as I am. What's your trouble? Did ye find ye dinner love Mary after ye won her? Did ye murder your mither or blacken your soul with some deadly sin? Man, if I had in my life what ye every day neglect and torture, heaven would come down and locate at the foot of the rainbow for me. But ye are no happy, Jimmy. Let's get at the root of the matter. While ye are unhappy, Mary will be also. We are responsible to God for her, and between us she is empty-armed, near to death, 
and almost dumb with misery. I have just sworn to her on the cross she loves that if she will make any more effort and get well, we will make her happy. Now, how are we going to do it? Another great groan burst from Jimmy, and he shivered as if with a chill. Let us look ourselves in the face, Danny went on, and see what we lack. What can we do for her? What will bring a song to her lips, licked to her beautiful eyes, love to her heart, and a living child to her arms? Wake up, man. By God, if you dinna set to work with me and solve this problem, I'll shake a solution out of ye. What I must suffer is my own, but what's the matter with ye? And why, when she loved and married ye, are you breaking Mary's heart? Answer me, man. Danny reached over and snatched the hat from Jimmy's forehead and stared at an inert heap. Jimmy lay senseless, and he looked like death. Danny rushed down to the water with the hat and splashed drops into Jimmy's face until he gasped for breath. When he recovered a little, he shrank from Danny and began to sob as if he were a sick ten-year-old child. "'I knew you'd go back on me, Danny,' he wavered. "'I've lost the only friend I've got, and I wish I was dead.' "'I have not gone back on ye,' persisted Danny, bathing Jimmy's face. Life means nothing to me, save as I can use it from Mary and fra ye. Be quiet and sit up here and help me work this thing out. Why are ye a discontented man, always wishing for any place save home? Why do ye spend all ye earn foolishly, so that ye are always hard up when ye might have affluence? Why does Mary lose her children, and why does she no wish she had na married ye? Who said she wished she hadn't married me? cried Jimmy. Do you mean to say you think she doesn't? blazed Danny. I ain't said anything, exclaimed Jimmy. Nah, and I seem to have damn poor luck getting ye to say anything. I dunna ask for tears nor fainting like a woman. Be a man, and let me into the secret of this muddle. There is a secret, and ye know it. What is it? Why are ye breaking the heart o' Mary Malone? Answer me, or for God I'll wring the answer from your body. And Jimmy killed over again. This time he was gone so far that Danny was frightened into a panic and called the doctor coming up the lane to Jimmy before he had time to see Mary. The doctor soon brought Jimmy around, prescribed quiet and sleep talked about heart trouble developing and symptoms of tremens, and Danny poured on water and gritted his teeth. And it ended by Jimmy being helped to Danny's cabin, undressed and put into bed, and then Danny went over to see what he could do for the nurse. She looked at him searchingly. Mr. McMoon, when were you last to sleep? she asked. I forget, answered Danny. When did you last have a good hot meal. I dunno know, replied Danny. Drink that, said the nurse, handing him the bowl of broth she carried, and going back to the stove for another. When I have finished making Mrs. Malone comfortable, I'm going to get you something to eat, and you are going to eat it. Then you are going to lie down on that cot where I can call you if I need you, and sleep six hours, and then you're going to wake up and watch by this door while I sleep my six. Even nurses must have some rest, you know. Ye first, said Danny. I'll be all right when I get food. Since you mention it, I believe I am almost mad with hunger. The nurse handed him another bowl of broth. Just drink that and drink slowly, she said, as she left the room. Danny could hear her speaking softly to Mary, and then all was quiet, and the girl came out and closed the door. She deftly prepared food for Danny, and he ate all she would allow him, and begged for more. But she firmly told him her hands were full now, 
and she had no one to depend on but him to watch after the turn of the night. So Danny lay down on the cot. He had barely touched it when he thought of Jimmy, so he got up quietly and started home. He had almost reached his back door when it opened and Jimmy came out. Danny paused, amazed at Jimmy's wild face and staring eyes. "'Don't you begin your cursed gibberish again!' cried Jimmy, at sight of him. "'I'm burning in all the torches of fire now, and I'll have a drink if I smash down cases and steal it!' Danny jumped for him, and Jimmy evaded him and fled. Danny started after. He had reached the barn before he began to think. "'I depend on you,' the nurse had said. "'Jimmy!' wait he called jimmy have you any money jimmy was running along the path toward town danny stopped he stood staring after jimmy for a second and then he deliberately turned went back and lay down on the cot where the nurse expected to find him when she wanted him to watch by the door of mary malone End of chapter six Foot of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. At the Foot of the Rainbow by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 7. The Apple of Discord Becomes a Jointed Rod. What do you think about fishing, Danny? asked Jimmy Malone. There was a licked frost last nicked, said Danny. It begins to look that way. I should think a week more, especially if there should come a good rain. Jimmy looked disappointed. His last trip to town had ended in a sodden week in the barn and at Danny's cabin. For the first time he had carried whiskey home with him. He had insisted on Danny drinking with him and wanted to fight when he would not. He addressed the bottle and Danny as the sovereign alchemist by turns and transmuted the leaden metal of life into pure gold of a glorious drunk until his craving was satisfied. Then he came back to work and reason one morning, and by the time Mary was about enough to notice him, he was Jimmy at his level best, and doing more than he had in years to try and interest and please her. Mary had fully recovered, and appeared as strong as she ever had been, but there was a noticeable change in her. She talked and laughed with a gaiety that seemed forced, and in the midst of it her tongue turned bitter, and Jimmy and Danny fled before it. The gray hairs multiplied on Danny's head with rapidity. He had gone to the doctor and to Mary's sister, and learned nothing more than the nurse could tell him. Danny was willing to undertake anything in the world for Mary, but just how to furnish the vital spark to an unborn babe was too big a problem for him. And Jimmy Malone was growing to be another. Heretofore, Danny had borne the brunt of the work and all of the worry. He had let Jimmy feel that his was the guiding hand. Jimmy's plans were followed whenever it was possible, and when it was not, Danny started Jimmy's way and gradually worked around to his own. But there had never been a time between them when things really came to a crisis, and Danny took the lead and said matters must go a certain way, that Jimmy had not acceded. In reality, Danny always had been the master. Now he was not. Where he lost control he did not know. He had tried several times to return to the subject of how to bring back happiness to Mary, and Jimmy immediately developed symptoms of another attack of heart disease, a tendency to start for town, or openly defied him by walking away. Yet Jimmy stuck to him closer than he ever had, and absolutely refused to go anywhere, or to do the smallest piece of work alone. Sometimes he grew sullen and morose when he was not drinking, and that was very unlike the gay Jimmy. Sometimes he grew wildly hilarious, as if he were bound to make such a racket that he could hear no sound save his own voice. So long as he stayed at home, helped with the work, and made an effort to please Mary, Danny hoped for the best, but his hopes never grew so bright that they shut out an awful fear that was beginning to loom in the future. But he tried in every way to encourage Jimmy, and to help him in the struggle he did not understand, so when he saw that Jimmy was disappointed about the fishing, he suggested that he should go alone. "'I guess not,' said Jimmy. "'I'd rather go to confession than go alone. What's the fun of fishing alone? All the fun there is to fishing is to watch the other fellow's eyes when you pull in a big one, and to try to hide yours from him when he gets it. I guess not. What have we got to do?' "'Finish cutting the corn, and get in the pumpkins before there comes frost enough to hurt them.' 
well come along said jimmy let's get it over i'm going to begin fishing for that bass the morning after the first black frost if i do go alone i mean it but you said began danny Hagany cried jimmy what a lot of time you've wasted if you've been capin account of all the things i've said haven't you learned by this time that i lie twice to the truth once danny laughed dinna say such things jimmy i hate to hear you of course i know about the fifty coons of the canniper and things like that honest i dinna believe ye could help it but no man need lie about a serious matter and when he knows he is deceiving another who trusts him jimmy became so white that he felt the color receding and turned to hide his face of course about those fifty coons knew what was the harm in that nobody believed it that wasn't a deceiving any ain yes but it was answered jimmy the boston man believed it and i guess he hasn't forgiven me if he did take my hand and drink with me you know i haven't a word from him about that coon skin i worked awful hard on that skin some way i tried to make it say to him again that i was sorry for that night's work sometimes i am afraid i killed the fellow oh ho scoffed danny men ain't so easily killed i've been thinking about it too and i'll tell you what i think i think he goes on long trips and only gets home every four or five months that package would have to wait his folks wouldn't have tried to send it after him he was a munly fellow all ricked and you will hear from him yet i'd like to said jimmy absently beating across his palm a spray of goldenrod he had broken just a line to tell me that he don't bear malice you will get it said danny have a little patience but that's your greatest fault jimmy you never did have only patience oh for god's sake don't begin on me faults again snapped jimmy i reckon i know me faults about as well as the next fellow i'm so doom full of faults that i've thought a lot lately about filling up and taking a sleep on the railroad a new fear wrung danny's soul you would never jimmy he implored sure not cried jimmy i'm no good catholic livin but if it came to dyin bedad i'd never could face it without first confessin to the priest and that would give the game away let's cut out dyin and cut the corn that's right agreed danny and let's work like men and then fish for a week or so before ice and trappin time comes again i'll wager i can beat you the first row bait scoffed jimmy bait with them club-footed fingers of yours you couldn't bait an egg just watch me if you are enough of a watch to keep your hands running at the same time jimmy worked feverishly for an hour and then he straightened and looked about him on the left lay the river its shores bordered with trees and bushes behind them was deep wood before them lay their open fields sloping down to the bottom the cabins on one side and the kingfisher embankment on the other there was a smoky haze in the air as always the blackbirds clamored along the river some crows followed the workers at a distance hunting for grains of corn and over in the woods a chewink scratched and rustled among the deep leaves as it searched for grubs from time to time a flock of quail arose before them with a whirr and scattered down the fields reassembling later at the call of their leader from a rider of the snake fence which enclosed the field bob bob white whistled danny bob bob white answered the quail i got my eye on that fellow said jimmy when he gets a little larger i'm going after him seems an awful pity to kill him said danny people rave over the lark but i vow i'd miss the quail most if they were both gone they are getting scarce well i didn't say i was going to kill the whole flock said jimmy i was just going to kill a few for mary and if i don't somebody else will mary didn't need anything better than any of her own fried chicken said danny and it's no true about hunters we've the river on ain side and the bluff on the other if we keep up our fishing signs and add hunting to them and just shut the other fellows out the birds will come here like everything wild gathers in national park out west you bet things know where they are taken care of well enough jimmy snipped a spray of purple ironwort with his corn cutter and stuck it through his suspender buckle i think that would be more fun than killing him if you're decent shot and your gun is clean jimmy remembered the crow that had escaped with the eggs at soap making you pretty well know you're going to bring down anything you aim at but it would be a dandy joke to shell a little corn as we husk it and to toll all the quail into rainbow boom and then cape the other fellows out bedad let's do it jimmy addressed the quail quaily quaily on the fence we think your singing's just immense stay right here and live with us and the fellow that shoots you will strike a fuss we can protect them all wrecked enough laughed danny and when the snow comes we can feed the cardinals like chickens. wish when we'd thrashed we'd saved a few sheaves of the wheat they do that in germany you know the last sheaf of the harvest they put up on a long pole at christmas and as a thank offering to the birds for their care of the crops my father often told of it that would be great said jimmy now look how dom slow you are why didn't you mention it at harvest i'd like things coming for me to take care of them gee makes me feel important just to think about it next year we'll do it sure they'd be a lot of company 
a man could work in this field today with all the flowers around him and the colors of the leaves like a garden and a lot of birds talking to him and not feel afraid of being alone afraid quoted danny in amazement for an instant jimmy looked startled then his love of proving his point arose yes afraid he repeated stubbornly afraid of being away from the sound of a human voice because when you are the voices of the black devils of conscience come twisting up from the ground in a little wiry whisper and moaning among the trees and whistling in the wind and rolling in the thunder and above all in the dark they screech and shout and roar we're after you jimmy malone we've almost got you jimmy malone you're going to burn in hell jimmy malone Jimmy leaned toward Danny and began in a low voice, but he grew so excited as he tried to picture the thing that he ended in a scream, and even then Danny, whose horrified eyes failed to recall him. Jimmy straightened, stared wildly behind him, and over the open, hazy field where the flowers bloomed and birds called and the long rows of shocks stood unconscious auditors of this strange scene. He lifted his hat and wiped the perspiration from his dripping face with the sleeve of his shirt, and as he raised his arm, the corn cutter flashed in the light my god it's awful danny it's so awful i can't begin to tell you danny's face was ashen jimmy dear old fellow he said how long has this been going on a million years said jimmy shifting the corn cutter to the hand that held his hat that he might moisten his fingers with saliva and rub it across his parched lips jimmy dear danny's hand was on jimmy's sleeve have you been to town in the night or anything like that lately no danny dear i ain't sneered jimmy setting his hat on the back of his head and testing the corn cutter with his thumb this ain't casey's me lad i've no more call there at this minute than you have it is casey's just the same said danny bitterly didn't you know the end of this sort of thing no be dad i don't said jimmy if i knew any way to end it you can bet i'd had enough i'd end it quick enough if i knew how but the railroad won't be in the end that would just be the beginning keep close to me danny and talk for mercy's sake talk do you think we could finish the corn by noon let's try said danny as he squared his shoulders to adjust them to his new load then we'll get in the pumpkins this afternoon and bury the potatoes and the cabbages and the turnips and then we're a boot fixed for winter we must take one day and gather our nuts suggested jimmy struggling to make his voice sound natural and you forgot the apples we must bury them too that's so said danny and when that's over we'll have nothing left to do but catch the bass and say farewell to the kingfisher i've already told you that i would relieve you of all responsibility about the bass said jimmy and when i do you won't need trouble to make your adieus to the kingfisher of the wabash he'll be one bird that won't be migrating this winter danny tried to laugh i'd like fall as much as any season of the year he said if it wasn't for the winter coming next i thought you liked winter and the trampin in the white woods and trappin and the long evenings with the book I do said Danny I must have been thinking of Mary she hated last winter so of course I had to go home when you were away and the Nicks were so long so cold and many of them alone I wonder if we can arrange for one of her sister's gals to stay with her this winter what's the matter with me asked Jimmy nothing if only you'd stay answered Danny all I'll be out of nights you could put in one eye said Jimmy I went last winter and before because when they clamored too loud I could be driving out the devils that way for a while and you always came for me but even that won't be stopping it now I wouldn't stick my head out alone after dark not if I was dying Jimmy you never felt that way before said Danny tell me what happened this summer to start you I've done a dumb sight of failin' that you didn't know anything about, answered Jimmy. I could work it off at Casey's for a while, but this summer things sort of came to a head. And I saw myself for fair, and before God, Danny, I didn't like me looks. Well, then I like ye looks, said Danny. Ye are the best company I ever was in. Ye are the only man I ever knew that I cared for, and I care for ye so much I have no the way to tell ye how much. You're possessed with a damn full idea, Jimmy, and ye got to shake it off. Such a great-hearted big man as you. I want to have it. There's the dinner bell, and ricked glad I'm I of it. That afternoon, when pumpkin gathering was over, and Jimmy had invited Mary out to separate the punk from the pumpkins, there was a wagon load of good ones above what they would need for their use. Danny proposed to take them to town and sell them. To his amazement, Jimmy refused to go along. I told you this morning that Casey wasn't calling me at present, he said, and when I am not called, I'd best not answer. I've promised Mary to top the onions and bury the celery and murder the baits do what with the beets inquired the puzzled Danny kill him kill him stone dead I'm too tender-hearted to be burying anything but a dead bait Danny but laugh like I knew you would old Ramphorinkus no thank you I don't go to town then Danny was scared he's going to be dreadfully seek or go mad he said so he drove to the village sold the pumpkins filled Mary's order for groceries and then went to the doctor and told him of Jimmy's latest developments 
it's the drink said the worthy disciple of esculapius it's the drink in time it makes a fool sodden and a bright man mad few men have sufficient brains to go crazy jimmy has he must stop the drink on the street danny encountered father michael the priest stopped him to shake hands how's mary malone he asked she is quite well new answered danny but she is not happy i live so close and see so much i know i thought of ye lately i thought of coming to see ye i'm not of your religion but mary is and what suits her is good enough for me i've tried to think of everything under the sun that might help and among other things i've thought of ye jimmy was confirmed in your church and he was more or less regular up to his marriage less mr mcnown much less said the priest since not at all why do you ask he is sick said danny he drinks a good deal he has been reckless about sleeping on the ground and knew if you will make this confidential the priest nodded he is talking about sleeping on the railroad and he's having delusions there are devils after him he is the finest fellow you ever knew father michael we've been friends all our lives ye have had much experience with men and it ought to count for something for all ye know and what i've told ye could his troubles be cured as the doctor suggests the priest did a queer thing you know him as no living man danny he said what do you think if he had asked me that this time last year i'd a said it's the drink at a jump but times this summer this morning for instance when he hadn't a drop in three weeks and didn't want ain when he could have come with me to town and wouldna and there were devils calling him from the ground and the trees and the sky out in the open cornfield it looked bad the priest's eyes were boring into danny's sick face how did it look he asked briefly it looked said danny and his voice dropped to a whisper it looked like he might carry a damned ugly secret that it would be better for him if he at least knew and the nature of that secret danny shook his head couldn't i give a guess at it known him all his life my only friend always been together square as a man as god ever made there's enough fault in him if he'd let drink alone got more faith in him than any and i ever knew i wouldn't trust mon on god's footstool if i had to lose faith in jimmy come to think of it that secret business is all old woman's scare the drink is telling on him if only he could be cured of that awful weakness all heaven would come down and settle in rainbow bottom they shook hands and parted without Donny realizing that he had told all he knew and learned nothing. Then he entered the post office for the weekly mail. He called for Malone's papers also, and with them came a slip from the express office notifying Jimmy that there was a package for him. Danny went to see if they would let him have it, and as Jimmy lived in the country, and as he and Danny were known to be partners, he was allowed to sign the book and carry away the long, slender wooden box with a Boston tag. The thread man had sent Jimmy a present, and from the appearance of the box, Danny made up his mind that it was a cane. Straight away he drove home at a scandalous rate of speed, and on the way he dressed Jimmy in a broadcloth suit, patent leathers, and a silk hat. Then he took him to a gold cure, where he learned to abhor whiskey in a week, and then to the priest, to whom he confessed that he had lied about the number of coons in the canoper. And so peace brooded in Rainbow Bottom, and all of them were happy again. For with the passing of summer, Danny had learned that heretofore there had been happiness of a sort for them, and that if they could all get back to the old footing it would be well, or at least far better than it was at present. With Mary's tongue dripping gall and her sweet face souring, and Jimmy hearing devils, no wonder poor Danny overheated his team in a race to carry a package that promised to furnish some diversion. Jimmy and Mary heard the racket, and standing on the celery hill, they saw Danny come clattering up the lane, and as he saw them he stood in the wagon and waved the package over his head. Jimmy straightened with a flourish, stuck the spade in the celery hill, and descended with great deliberation. I mentioned to Danny this morning, he said, that it was about time I was hearing from the thrid man. Oh, do you suppose it is something from Boston? The eagerness in Mary's voice made it sound almost girlish again. Hunt the hatchet, hissed Jimmy, and walked very leisurely into the cabin. Danny was visibly excited as he entered. I think ye have heard from the thread man, he said, handing Jimmy the package jimmy took it and examined it carefully he never before in his life had an express package the contents of which he did not know it behooved him to get all there was out of the pride and the joy of it mary laid down the hatchet so close that it touched jimmy's hand to remind him now what do you suppose he has sent you she inquired eagerly her hand straying toward the packages jimmy tested the box it don't weigh much he said but one end of it's the heaviest he set the hatchet in a tiny crack and with one rip stripped off the cover inside lay a long brown leather case with small buckles and in one end a little leather case flat on one side rounding on the other and it too fastened with a buckle jimmy caught sight of a paper book folded in the bottom of the box as he lifted the case 
with trembling fingers he unfastened the buckles the whole thing unrolled and disclosed a case of leather sewn in four divisions from top to bottom and from the largest of these protruded a shining object jimmy caught this and began to draw and the shine began to lengthen just what i thought exclaimed danny he sent you a fine cane a hint to cape out of his small back the next time he goes promenading on a cow kitcher the devil exploded jimmy his quick eyes had caught a word on the cover of the little book in the bottom of the box a cane a cane look at that will ya he flashed six inches of grooved silvery handle before their faces and three feet of shining black steel scarcely thicker than a lead pencil cane he cried scornfully then he picked up the box and opening it drew out a little machine that shone like a silver watch and setting it against the handle slipped a small slide over each end and held it firmly and shone bravely oh jimmy what is it cried mary me cane answered jimmy me new cane from boston didn't you hear danny saying what it was this little arrangement is my synclimator like they put on wheels and buggies now to tell how far you've traveled the way this works i just tie this silk thread to my doorknob and off i walk with it reeling out behind and when i turn back it takes up as i come and when i get home i take the yardstick and measure me string and be the same token it tells me how far i've traveled and as he talked he drew out another shining length and added it to the first and then another and a last fine as a wheat straw these last gents i'm adding he explained to mary are so that if i have me cane when i'm riding i can stretch it out and top up me horses with it and betimes if i should ever break me old cane fish pole i could take this down to the river and there the books call it whip in the water see cane be jesus it's the jim dandiest little fishing rod anybody in this parts ever set eyes on lord what a beauty he turned to danny and shook the shining slender thing before his envious eyes who gets the black bass now he triumphed in tones of utter conviction there is no use taking time to explain to any fisherman who has read thus far that danny the patient danny the long-suffering felt abused how would you feel yourself the thread man might have sent twa was his thought the only decent treatment he got that nicked was from me and if i'd let jimmy hit him he'd have gone through the wall but there is never anything for me and it was true there never was aloud he said didn't bother to hunt the steel yards mary we went away it until he brings it home yes and by gum i'll bring it with this look here's a picture of a man in a boat pulling in a whale with a pole just like this bragged jimmy yes said danny that's what it's made for a boat and open water if you're going to fish with that thing along the river we'll have to cut down all the trees and that will dry up the water that's not for river fishing jimmy was intently studying the book mary tried to take the rod from his hand let be he cried hanging on you'll break it i guess steel don't break so easy she said aggrievedly i just want to heft it light as a feather boasted jimmy fish all day and it won't tire a man at all done unjoint it and put it in its case and not go dragging up everything along the bank like a living stump puller this book says this line will bear twenty pounds pressure and sometimes it's taken an hour to tire out a fish if it's a fighter i bet you the black bass is a fighter from what we know of him you can watch me land him and see what you think about it suggested danny jimmy held the book with one hand and lightly waved to the rod with the other in a way that would have developed nerves in an indian he laughed absently with me shooting bait all over his pool with this he asked i guess not but you can't fish for the bass with that jimmy malone cried mary hotly you agreed to fish fair for the bass and it wouldn't be fair for you to use that when denny only has his old cane pole danny get you a steel pole too she begged if jimmy's going to fish with that there will be all the more glory in taking the bass from him with the pole i have answered danny you keep out cried jimmy angrily to mary it was a fair bargain he made it himself each man was to fish surface or deep and with his own pole and bait i guess this is my pole ain't it yes said mary but it wasn't yours when you made the agreement you know very well danny expected you to fish with the same kind of pole and bait he did didn't you danny yes said danny i did because i never dreamed of him having any other but since he has it i think he's in his rights if he fishes with it i didn't care in the first place he will only scare the bass away from him with the racket that reel will make and in the second if he tries to land it with that thing he will smash it and lose the fish there's a long-handled net to land things with that goes with these rods he'd better send you one now you'll have to jump into the river and land a fish by hand if you hook it that's true cried mary here's one in the picture she had snatched the book from jimmy he snatched it back be careful you'll tear that he cried i was just going to say that i would get some fine wire or mosquito bar and make one danny's fingers were itching to take the rod if only for an instant he looked at it longingly 
but jimmy was impervious he whipped it softly about and eagerly read from the book tells here about a man taking a fish that weighs forty pounds with a pole just like this he announced scat jumpin jehoshaphat what do you think of that couldn't you fish turn about with it inquired mary nah we couldn't a fish turn about with it answered danny now with that pole jimmy would throw a fit if anybody else touched it and he's welcome to it he never in this world will catch the black bass with it if only i had some way to put just fifteen feet more line on my pole i'd show him how to take the bass tomorrow the way we always have come to lose it is with two short lines we have to try and land it before it's tired out and strong enough to break and tear away it must have ragged jaws and a dozen pieces of lines hanging to it for both of us have hooked it time and again when it strikes me if only i could give it fifteen feet more line i could land it can't you fix some way asked mary i'll try answered danny and in the meantime i'll just be giving it twenty off my dandy little reel and away goes me with mr bass said jimmy i must take it to town and have its picture took to send to the thrid man and that was the last straw danny had given up being allowed to touch the rod and was on his way to unhitch his team and do the evening work the day had been trying and just for the moment he forgot everything save that his longing fingers had not touched that beautiful little fishing rod that boston man forgot another thing he said the dude who shindies round with those things in the pictures wears a damn dinky little pleated coat end of chapter seven of at the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tech savvy at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter chapter eight when the black bass stuck lots of fish down in the brook all you need is a rod and a line and a hook hummed jimmy still lovingly fingering his possessions did danny ever say a thing like that to you before asked mary oh he's dead so explained jimmy he thinks he should have had a jinted rod too and so he had replied mary you said yourself that you might have killed that man if danny hadn't shown you that you were wrong you must think stuff like this is got at the ten cent store said jimmy oh no i don't said mary i expect it cost three or four dollars three or four dollars sneered jimmy all the sense a woman has feast your eyes on this book and read that just this little reel alone costs fifteen and there's no telling what the rod is worth why it's turned right out of the pure steel same as if it were wood look for yourself thanks no i'm afraid to touch it said mary oh you're sore too laughed jimmy with all that money in it i should think you could see why i couldn't want it broke you've sat there and whipped it around for an hour would it break if for me or danny to do the same thing if it had been his you'd have had a warm on it and been down to the river trying it for him by now warm scoffed jimmy a warm that's a good one idiot you don't fish with worms with a gented rod well what do you fish with hummingbirds no you fish with jimmy stopped and i mary dubiously you fish with a lot of things he continued some of them come in little books and they look like moths and some like snake faders and some of them are bucktail and bits of tin painted to look shiny once there was a man in town who had a many made of rubber and all painted up just like life there were hooks on its head and on its back and its belly and its tail so that if a fish snapped at it anywhere it got hooked i should say so exclaimed mary it's no fair way to fish to use more than one hook you might just as well take a net and wade in and seen out the fish as to take a lot of hooks and rake him out well who's going to take a lot of hooks and rake them out i didn't say anybody was i was just saying you wouldn't be fair to the fish if they did course i wouldn't fish with no rigging like that when danny only has one old hook when we fish for the bass i won't use but one hook either all the same i'm going to have some of those fancy baits i'm going to get jim skeels at the drug store to order them for me i know just how you do said jimmy flourishing the rod 
You put on your bait, and quite a heavy sinker, and you wind it up to the end of the rod, and then you stand up in your boat. Stand up in your boat? I wish you'd let me finish, or on the bank, and you take this little whipper snapper, and you touch the spot on the reel that releases the thread, and you give the rod a little toss, easy as throwing away chips, and off maybe fifty feet your bait hits the water, spat and snap, goes Mr. Bass, and stick goes the hook. See? What I see is that if you want to fish that way in the Wabash, you'll have to wait until the dredge goes through and they make a canal out of it. For be the time you'd be throwed fifty feet and your fish had run another fifty, there's just one hundred snags and logs and stumps between you, one for every foot of the way. It must look pretty on deep water. There it can be done right. But I bet anything that if you go to the fooling with that on our river, Danny gets the bass. Not much. Danny don't gets the bass, said Jimmy confidently. Just you come out there and let me show you how this works. Now you see I put me sinker on the end of the thread. No hook, of course, for practice, and I touch this little spring here. And away goes me bait, slick as grace. Mr. Bass is laying in a base weeds right out there. Fornest, the pie plant bed, and the bait strikes the water at the edge. See? And snap, he takes it and sails off slow, to swallow it at the leisure. Here's where I don't pull a morsel. Just let them rin and swallow, and when me line is well out, and he has me bait all digested. Yank! I gave him the round up and thin the fun begins. He leaps clear of the water, and I see his ten pound. If he rins from me, I give him rope, and if he rins too, I dig in, working me little machine for dear life to take up the thread just before it slacks. When he sees me, makes a dash back, and I just got to release me line and let him go, because he'd bust this little silk thread all to thunder if I tried to force him unpleasant to his intentions and so we cape it up until his plum wore out and comes a promenade up to me boat bank i made and i scoops him in and that's sport mary that's a man's fishing now watch he's in them bass weeds before the pie plant like i said and i'm here on the bank and i think he's there so i give me little jinted rod a whip and a swing jimmy gave the rod a whip and a swing the sinker shot in air struck the limb of an apple tree and wound a dozen times around it jimmy said things and mary giggled she also noticed that danny had stopped work and was standing in the barn door watching intently jimmy climbed the tree and wound the line and tried again i didn't notice that damn apple limb sticking out there he said now you watch right out there among the bass weeds for ins the pie plant to avoid another limb, Jimmy aimed too low, and the sinker shot under the rowel platform not ten feet from him. Lucky you didn't get fast in the bass weeds, said Mary, as Jimmy reeled in. Well, I got to get me range, explained Jimmy. This time, Jimmy swung too high. The spring slipped from his unaccustomed thumb. The sinker shot about and behind him and became entangled in the eaves, while yards of the fine silk line flew off the spinning reel and dropped entangled masses at his feet, and in an effort to do something, Jimmy reversed the reel, and it wound back on tangles, and all until it became completely clocked. Mary had sat down on the back steps to watch the exhibition. Now she stood up to laugh. And that's just what will happen to you at the river, she said, while you are fooling with that thing which ain't for rivers, and which you don't know beans about handling. Danny will haul you in the bass and serve you right too. Mary, said Jimmy, I never stuck ye all me life, but if you don't go in the house and shut up, I'll knock the head off ye. I wouldn't be advising you to, she said. Danny is watching you. Jimmy glanced toward the barn in time to see Danny's shaking shoulders as he turned from the door. With unexpected patience, he firmly closed his lips and went after a ladder. By the time he had the sinker loose and the line untangled, supper was ready. 
by the time he had mastered the reel and could land the sinker accurately in front of various imaginary beds of bass weeds danny had finished the night work in both stables and gone home but his back door stood open and therefrom there protruded the point of a long heavy cane fish pole by the light of the lamp on his table danny could be seen working with pincers and a ball of wire i wonder what he thinks he can do said jimmy i suppose he is trying to fix some way to get that fifteen feet more line he needs replied mary when they went to bed the light still burned and the broad shoulders of danny bent over the pole mary had fallen asleep but she was awakened by jimmy slipping from the bed he went to the window and looked toward danny's cabin there he left the bedroom and she could hear him crossing to the back window of the next room then came a smothered laugh and he softly called her she went to him danny's figure stood out clear and strong in the moonlight in his woodyard his black outline looked unusually powerful in the silvery whiteness surrounding it he held his fishing pole in both hands and swept a circle about him that would have required considerable space on lake michigan and made a cast toward the barn the line ran out smoothly and evenly and through the gloom mary saw jimmy's figure straighten and his lips close in surprise then danny began taking in line that process was so slow jimmy doubled up and laughed again be looking at that will you he heaved what does a darn fool think the black bass will be doing while he's taking in line on that young wind lass there'd be no room on the river to do that answered mary serenely Danny wouldn't be so foolish as to try. All he wants now is to see if his line will run, and it will. When he gets to the river, he'll swing his bait where he wants it, with his pole, like he always does. And when the bass strikes, he'll give it the extra fifteen feet more line he said he needed. And then he'll have the pole and line with which he can land it. Not on your life he won't, said Jimmy. He opened the back door and stepped out just as Danny raised the pole again. Hey, you! Quit raising! Come out here! yelled Jimmy. I want to get some sleep. Across the night, tinged neither with chagrin nor rancor, boomed the big voice of Danny. Believe I have my extra line fixed, so it works all right, he said. Awful sorry if I waked you, though I was quiet. How much did you make off that? inquired Mary. Two points, answered Jimmy found out that danny ain't so at me any longer than that you are next morning was no sort of angler's weather but the afternoon gave promise of being good fishing by the morrow danny worked about the farms and preparing for the winter jimmy worked with him until mid-afternoon then he hailed a boy passing and they went away together at supper time jimmy had not returned mary came to where danny worked where is jimmy she asked i didn't know said danny he went away a while ago with some boy i didn't notice who and he didn't tell you where he was going no and he didn't take either of his fish poles no mary's lips thinned to a mere line then it's casey's she said and turned away danny was silent presently mary came back if jimmy won't come till morning she asked or comes in shape that he can't fish will you go without him tomorrow was the day we agreed on answered danny will you go without him persisted mary what would he do if it were me asked danny what have you ever done to jimmy malone what he would do if he were you is there any reason why ye not want me to land the black bass mary there is no particular reason why i don't want your living with jimmy to make you like him answered mary my temper is being wined and i can see where it's beginning to show on you whatever you do don't do what he would dinner be hard on him mary he doesn't think urged danny you never said twelve words he don't think he never thought about anybody in his life except himself and he never will maybe he didn't go to town Maybe the sun won't rise in the morning, and it will always be dark after this. Come in and get your supper. I'd best pick up something to eat at home, said Danny. 
I have some good food cooked, and it's a pity to be throwing it away. What's the use? You've done a long day's work, more for us than yourself, as usual. Come along and get your supper. Danny went, and as he was washing at the back door, Jimmy came through the barn and up the walk. He was fresh and in fine spirits, and wherever he had been, it was a sure thing that it was nowhere near Casey's. "'Where have you been?' asked Mary wonderingly. "'Robin Graves,' answered Jimmy promptly. "'I needed a few steps in me business, so I just went out to Five Mile and got em. "'What are you going to do with em, Jimmy?' chuckled Danny. "'Use em for base bait. Now rattle, old snake.' replied jimmy after supper danny went to the barn for the shovel to dig worms for bait and noticed that jimmy's rubber waters hanging on the wall were covered almost to the top with fresh mud and water stains and danny's wonder grew early the next morning they started for the river as usual jimmy led the way he proudly carried his new rod Danny followed with the basket of lunch Mary had insisted on packing, his big cane pole, a can of worms, and a shovel, in case they ran out of bait. Danny had recovered his temper, and was just great-hearted big Danny again. He talked about the south wind, and shivered with the frost, and listened for the splash of the bass. Jimmy had little to say. He seemed to be thinking deeply. No doubt he felt in his soul that they should settle the question of who landed the bass with the same rods they had used when the contest was proposed and that was not all when they came to the temporary bridge jimmy started to cross it and then he called to him to wait he was forgetting his worms i don't want any worms answered jimmy briefly he walked on danny stood staring after him for he did not understand that then he went slowly to his side of the river and deposited his load under a tree where it would be out of the way. He laid down his pole, took a rude wooden spool of heavy fish cord from his pocket, and passed the line through the loop next the handle and so on the length of the rod to the point. Then he wired on a sharp bass hook and wound the wire far up the double line. As he worked, he kept an eye on Jimmy. He was doing practically the same thing. But just as Danny had fastened on a light lead to carry his line, a souse in the river opposite attracted his attention. Jimmy hauled from the water a minnow bucket, and opening it took a live minnow and placed it on his hook. Ready, he called, as he resank the bucket and stood on the bank holding his line in his fingers and watching the minnow play at his feet. The fact that Danny was a Scotchman and unusually slow and patient did not alter the fact that he was just a common human being. The lump that arose in his throat was so big and so hard he did not try to swallow it. He hurried back into the rainbow bottom. The first log he came across he kicked over, and groveling in the rotten wood and loose earth with his hands he brought up a half dozen bluish white grubs. He tore up the ground for the length of the log, and then he went to others, cramming the worms and dirt with them into his pockets. When he had enough, he went back, and with extreme care placed three of them on his hook. He tried to see how Jimmy was going to fish, but he could not tell. So Danny decided that he would cast in the morning, fish deep at noon, and cast again toward evening. He rose, turned to the river, and lifted his rod. As he stood looking over the channel and the pool where the bass homed, the kingfisher came rattling down the river, and as if in answer to its cry, the black bass gave a leap that sent the water flying. "'Ready?' cried Danny, swinging his pole over the water. As the word left his lips, whiz! Jimmy Minnow landed in the middle of the circles, widening about the rise of the base. There was a rush and a snap and Danny saw the jaws of the big fellow close within an inch of the minnow, and he swam after it for a yard, as Jimmy slowly reeled in. Danny waited a second, and then softly dropped his grubs on the water, just before where he figured that bass would be. He could hear Jimmy smothering oats. Danny said something himself as he untouched bait near the bank. He lifted it, swung it out, and slowly trailed it in again. Spat! came Jimmy's minnow almost at his feet, and again the bass leaped for it. Again he missed. As the minnow reeled away the second time, 
Danny swung his grubs higher and struck the water, spat as the minnow had done. Snap went the bass. One instant the line strained, the next the hook came up stripped clean of bait. Then Danny and Jimmy really went at it, and they were strangers. Not a word of friendly banter crossed the river. They cast until the bass grew suspicious and would not rise to the bait. Then they fished deep. Then they cast again. If Jimmy fell into trouble with his reel, Danny had the honesty to stop fishing until it worked again, but he spent the time borrowing for grubs until his hands resembled the claws of an animal. Sometimes they sat and still fished. Sometimes they warily slipped along the bank, trailing bait a few inches under water. Then they would cast and skitter by turns. The kingfisher struck his stump and tilted on again. His mate and their family of six followed in his lead so that their rattle was almost constant. A fussy little red-eyed vireo asked questions, first of Jimmy and then crossing the river besieged Danny, but neither of the stern-faced fishermen paid it any heed. The blackbirds swung on the rushes and talked over the season. As always, a few crows cawed about the deep woods, and the chewinks threshed among the dry leaves. A band of larks were gathering for migration, and the frosty air was vibrant with their calls to each other. Kildeers were circling about them in flocks, a half-dozen robins gathered over a wild grapevine, and chirped cheerfully as they pecked at the frosted fruit. At times the pointed nose of a muskrat wove its way across the river, leaving a shiny ripple in its wake. In the deep woods squirrels barked and chattered. Frost loosened crimson leaves came whirling down, settling in a bright blanket that covered the water several feet from the bank, and the unfortunate bees that had fallen into the river struggled frantically to gain a footing on them. Water beetles shot over the surface in a small shining parties, and schools of tiny minnows played along the banks. Once a black ant assassinated an enemy on Danny's shoe by creeping up behind it and puncturing its abdomen. Noon came, and neither of the fishermen spoke or moved from their work. The lunch Mary had prepared with such care they had forgotten. A little afternoon, Danny got another strike, deep fishing. Mid-afternoon found them still even, and patiently fishing. Then it was not so long until supper time, and the air was steadily growing colder. The south wind had veered into the west, and signs of a black frost were in the air. About this time the larks arose as with one accord, and with a whir of wings that proved how large the flock was, they sailed straight south. Jimmy hauled his minnow bucket from the river, poured the water from it, and picked his last minnow, a dead one, from the grass. Danny was watching him, and rightly guessed that he would fish deep, so Danny scooped the remaining dirt from his pockets and found three grubs. He placed them on his hook, lightened his sinker, and prepared to skitter once more. Jimmy dropped his minnow beside the kingfisher stump and let it sink. Danny hit the water at the base of the stump where it had not been disturbed for a long time. A sharp spat with his worms. Something seized his bait and was gone. Danny planted his feet firmly, squared his jaws, gripped his rod, and loosened his line. As his eye followed it, he saw to his amazement that Jimmy's line was sailing off down to the river beside his and heard the reel singing. Danny was soon close to the end of his line. He threw his weight into a jerk enough to have torn the head from a fish, and down the river the black bass leaped clear of the water, doubled, and with a mighty shake tried to throw the hook from his mouth. "'Got him fast, by God!' screamed Jimmy in triumph. Straight toward them rushed the fish. Jimmy reeled wildly. Danny gathered in his line by yard lengths and grasped it with his hand that held the rod. Near them, the base leaped again and sped back down the river. Jimmy's reel began to sing louder, and his line followed Danny's. Instantly, Jimmy went wild. "'Stop pulling me, little silk thread!' he yelled. "'I've got the black base hooked fast as a rod, and your damn clothes line is sawing across me. Cut there! Cut that damn rope! Quick!' "'He's mine! I'll land him!' Rode Danny. Cut yourself and let me get my fish. And so it happened that when Mary Malone, tired of waiting for the boys to come and anxious as to the day's outcome, slipped down to the Wabash to see what they were doing, 
she heard sounds that almost paralyzed her shaking with fear she ran toward the river and paused at a little thicket behind danny jimmy danced and raged on the opposite bank cut he yelled cut that damn cloth and let me bass loose cut your line i say danny stood with his feet planted wide apart and his jaws set he drew his line steadily toward him and jimmy's followed yes see exulted danny you cross me the base is mine reel out your line till i land him if ye didn't want it broken if you don't cut your damn line i will raved jimmy cut nothing cried danny let's see you try to touch it into the river went jimmy splash went danny from his bank he was nearer the tangled lines but the water was deepest on his side and the mud of the bed held his feet jimmy reached the cross line knife in hand by the time danny was there will you cut cried jimmy nah bellowed danny i've given up every damn thing to ye all my life but i will no give up the black face he's mine and i'll land him jimmy made a lunge for the lines danny swung his pole backward drawing them his way jimmy slashed again danny dropped his pole and with a sweep caught the twisted lines in his fingers no let's see you cut my line babby he jeered jimmy's fist flew straight and the blood streamed from danny's nose danny dropped the lines and straightened you he painted you and no other words came if jimmy had been possessed of any small particle of reason he lost it at the sight of blood on danny's face you're a damn fish thief he screamed ye lie breathed danny but his hand did not lift you are a coward you're afraid to strike like a man hit me you don't dare hit me ye lie repeated danny you're a dog Painted Jimmy. I've used you to wait on me all me life. That's the God's truth, cried Danny, but he made no movement to strike. Jimmy leaned forward with a distorted, insane face. That time you sent me to marry for you. I lied to her and married her myself. Now will you fight like a man? Danny made a spring, and Jimmy crumpled up in his grasp. No, I will choke the miserable tongue out of your heed and twist the head of your body and tear the body to mince meat raved danny and he promptly began the job with one awful effort jimmy tore the gripping hands from his throat a little lie he gasped it's all a lie it's the truth before god it's the truth mary malone tried to scream behind him it's the truth it's the truth and her ears told her that she was making no sound as with dry lips she mouthed it over and over and then she fainted and sank down in the bushes danny's hands relaxed a little and he lifted the weight of jimmy's body by his throat and sent him on his feet i give you it just any chance he said is that the truth jimmy's awful eyes were bulging from his head his hands were clawing on his throat and his swollen lips repeated it over and over as breath came it's a lie it's a lie i think so myself said danny ye never would have dared ye have known that i'd find you some day and on that day i'll kill ye as i would a copperhead a lie painted jimmy then why did ye tell it and danny's fingers threatened to renew their grip i thought if i could make you strike back gasped jimmy my hitting you wouldn't seem so bad then danny's hands relaxed oh jimmy jimmy he cried was there ever any other man like ye then he remembered the cause of the trouble but i'm everlastingly damned danny went on if i'll give up the black face to ye unless it's on your line get yourself up there on your bank the shove he gave jimmy almost upset him and jimmy waded back and as he climbed the bank danny was behind him after him he dragged a tangled mass of lines and poles and at the last of the bank and on the grass two big fish one the great black base of horseshoe bend and the other nearly as large a channel catfish undoubtedly one of those which had escaped in the wabash in an overflow of the salina reservoir that spring 
no i'll cut said danny keep your eyes on me sharp see me cut my line at the end of the pole he snipped the line in two no watch he cautioned i didn't want contradiction about this he picked up the base and taking the line by which it was fast at its mouth he slowly drew it through his fingers the very silk line slipped away and the heavy cord whipped out free is this my line asked danny holding it up jimmy nodded is the black base my fish speak up cried danny dangling the fish from the line it's yours admitted jimmy then i'll be damned if i don't want to do what i please my own cried danny with trembling fingers he extracted the hook and dropped it he took the gasping big fish in both hands and tested its weight almost six he said mitchty near six and he tossed the black base back in the wabash then he stopped and gathered up his pole and line with one foot he kicked the catfish the tangled silk line and the jointed rod toward jimmy take your fish he said he turned and plunged into the river recrossed as it he came gathered up the dinner pail and shovel passed mary malone a tumbled heap in the bushes and started toward his cabin the black bay struck the water with a splash and sank to the mud to the bottom where he lay joyfully soaking his dry gills parched tongue and glazed eyes he scooped water with his tail and poured it over his torn jaw and then he said to his progeny children let this be a warning to you never rise to put one grub at a time three is too good to be true there is always a stinger in their midst and the black face ruefully shook his sore head and scooped more water end of chapter eight recording by tech savvy www.techsavvy.wordpress.com of at the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter chapter 9 when jimmy malone came to confession Danny never before had known such anger as possessed him when he trudged homeward across Rainbow Bottom. His brain whirled in a tumult of conflicting passions, and his heart pained worse than his swelling face. In one instant the knowledge that Jimmy had struck him possessed him with a desire to turn back and do murder. In the next, a sense of profound scorn for the cowardly lie which had driven him to the rage that kills encompassed him. And then in a surge came compassion for Jimmy at the remembrance of the excuse he had offered for saying that thing How childish but how like Jimmy what was the use in trying to deal with him as if he were a man a Great spoiled selfish baby was all he ever would be The fallen leaves rustled about Danny's feet the blackbirds above him in chattering debate discussed migration a stiff breeze swept the fields topped the embankment and rushed down circling about Danny and setting his teeth chattering For he was almost as wet as if he had been completely immersed as The chill struck in from force of habit He thought of Jimmy if he was ever going to learn how to take care of himself a man past 35 should know Would he come home and put on dry clothing? but when had Jimmy taken care of himself Danny felt that he should go back bring him home and make him dress quickly a Sharp pain shot across Danny's swollen face his lips shut firmly No, Jimmy had struck him and Jimmy was in the wrong the fish was his and he had a right to it No man living would have given it up to Jimmy after he had changed poles and slipped away with a boy and gotten those minnows too and wouldn't offer him even one much good they had done him caught a catfish on a dead one Wonder if he would take the catfish to town and have its picture taken Mighty fine fish too that channel cat if it hadn't been for the black bass 
they would have wondered and exclaimed over it and carefully weighed it and commented on the gamey fight it made just the same as he was glad that he landed the bass and he got it fairly if jimmy's old catfish mixed up with his line he could not help that he baited hooked played and landed the bass all right and without any minnows either when he reached the top of the hill he realized that he was going to look back in spite of jimmy's selfishness in spite of the blow in spite of the ugly lie jimmy had been his lifelong partner and his only friend and stiffen his neck as he would danny felt his head turning he deliberately swung his fish pole into the bushes and when it caught as he knew it would he set down his load and turned as if to release it not a sight of jimmy anywhere danny started on where are you jimmy malone a thin little wiry thread of a cry that seemed to come twisting as if wrung from the chill air about him whispered in his ear and danny jumped dropped his load and ran for the river he couldn't see any sign of jimmy he hurried over the shaky little bridge they had built the catfish lay gasping on the grass the case and jointed rod lay on a log but jimmy was gone danny gave the catfish a shove that sent it well into the river and ran for the shoals at the lower curve of horseshoe bend the tracks of jimmy's crossing were plain and after him hurried danny he ran up the hill and as he reached the top he saw jimmy climb on a wagon out on the road danny called but the farmer touched up his horses and trotted away without hearing him the fool to ride thought danny no he will chill to the bone danny cut across the fields to the lane and gathered up his load with the knowledge that jimmy had started for town came the thought of mary what was he going to say to her he would have to make a clean breast of it and he did not like the showing in fact he simply could not make a clean breast of it tell her he could not tell her he would lie to her once more this one time for himself he would tell her he fell in the river to account for his wet clothing and bruised face and wait until jimmy came home and see what he told her he went to the cabin and tapped at the door there was no answer so he opened it and set the lunch basket inside then he hurried home built a fire bathed and put on dry clothing he wondered where mary was he was ravenously hungry now he did all the evening work and as she still did not come he concluded that she had gone to town and that jimmy knew she was there of course that was it jimmy could get dry clothing of his brother-in-law to be sure mary had gone to town that was why jimmy went and he was right mary had gone to town when sense slowly returned to her she sat up in the bushes and stared about her then she arose and looked toward the river the men were gone mary guessed the situation rightly they were too much of river men to drown in a few feet of water they scarcely would kill each other they had fought and danny had gone home and jimmy to the consolation of cases where should she go mary malone's lips set in a firm line it's the truth it's the truth she panted over and over and now that there was no one to hear she found that she could say it quite plainly as the sense of her outraged womanhood swept over her she grew almost deliriously i hope you killed him danny mcnown she raved i hope you killed him for if you didn't i will oh oh she was almost suffocating with rage the only thing clear to her was that she never again would live an hour with jimmy malone he might have gone home probably he did for dry clothing she would go to her sister she hurried across the bottom with wavering knees she climbed the embankment then skirting the fields she half walked half ran to the village and selecting back streets and alleys tumbled half distracted into the home of her sister holy virgin screamed katie dolan whatever to be ailing you mary malone jimmy jimmy sobbed the shivering mary i knew it i knew it i've expected it for years cried katie they've had a fight just what i look for i always told you they were too thick to last and jimmy told danny he'd lied to me and married me himself he did i saw him do it 
screamed katie and danny tried to kill him i hope to heaven he got it done for if any man ever needed killin a cop's named jimmy malone would a looked good to me any time these fifteen years i always said and he took it back just like the red devil i knew he'd do it and of course that mutton head of a danny mcnown believed him whatever he said of course he did i knew it didn't i say so first and i tried to scream and my tongue stuck sure you poor lamb my tongue always sticks that's what i expected and me head just went round and i keeled over in the bushes i've told dolan a thousand times i knew it it's no news to me and when i came to they were gone and i don't know where and i don't care but i won't go back i won't go back i'll not live with him another day oh katie think how you'd feel if someone had separated you and dolan before you'd even been together katie dolan gathered her sister into her arms you poor lamb she wailed i've known every word of this for fifteen years and if i'd had the least idea to so i'd have busted jimmy malone to smithereens before it ever happened i won't go back i won't go back raved mary i guess you won't go back cried katie patting every available spot on mary or making dashes at her own eyes to stop the flow of tears i guess you won't go back you'll stay right here with me i've always wanted you i always said i'd love to have you i've told them from the start there was something wrong out there i've expected you every day for years and i never was so surprised in all my life as when you came now don't you shed another tear the lord knows this is enough for anybody none at all would be too many for jimmy malone you get right into bid and i'd make you a cup of red pepper tea to take the chill out of you and if jimmy malone comes round to this house i'll have him out with a poker and if danny mcnown comes south satterin after him i'll stretch him out too yis and if dolan's got anything to say he can take his medicine like the wrist the men are all of a pace anyhow i've always said it if i wouldn't like to get me fingers on that haven never go into confession spending everything on himself you needed for decent living let him come just let him come thus forestalled with knowledge and overwhelmed with kindness mary malone cuddled up in bed and sobbed herself to sleep and katie dolan assured her as long as she was conscious that she always had known it and if jimmy malone came near she had the poker ready danny did the evening work when he milked he drank most of it but that only made him hungrier so he ate the lunch he had brought back from the river as he sat before a roaring fire his heart warmed with his body irresponsible jimmy always had aroused something of the paternal instinct in danny someone had to be responsible so danny had been some way he felt responsible now with another man like himself it would have been man to man but he always had spoiled jimmy now who was to blame that he was spoiled Danny was very tired his face throbbed and ached painfully and it was a sight to see His bed never had looked so inviting and never had the chance to sleep been further away With a sigh he buttoned his coat Twisted an old scarf around his neck and started for the barn There was going to be a black frost the cold seemed to pierce him He hitched to the single buggy and drove into town. He went to Casey's and asked for Jimmy he isn't here said casey has he been here asked danny casey hesitated and then blurted out he said you wasn't his keeper and if you came after him to tell you to go to hell then danny was sure that jimmy was in the back room drying his clothing so he drove to mrs dolan's and asked if mary were there for the night mrs dolan said she was and she was going to stay and he might tell jimmy malone that he need not come near them unless he wanted his head laid open she shut the door forcibly danny waited until casey closed at eleven and to his astonishment jimmy was not among the men who came out that meant that he had drunk lightly after all slipped from the back door and gone home and yet would he do it after what he had said about being afraid if he had not drunk heavily he would not go into the night alone when he had been afraid in the daytime Danny climbed from the buggy once more and patiently searched the alley and the street leading to the footpath across farms 
no jimmy then danny drove home stabled his horse and tried jimmy's back door it was unlocked if jimmy were there he probably would be lying across the bed in his clothing and danny knew that mary was in town he made a light and cautiously entered the sleeping room intending to undress and cover jimmy but jimmy was not there danny's mouth fell open he put out the light and stood on the back steps the frost had settled in a silver sheen over the roofs of the barns and the sheds and a scum of ice had frozen over a tub of drippings at the well danny was bitterly cold he went home and hunted out his winter overcoat lighted his lantern picked up a heavy cudgel in the corner and started to town on foot over the path that lay across the fields he followed it to casey's back door he went to mrs dolan's again but everything was black and silent there there had been evening trains he thought of jimmy's frequent threat to go away he dismissed that thought grimly there had been no talk of going away lately and he knew that jimmy had little money danny started for home and for a rod on either side he searched the path as he came to the back of the barns he rated himself for not thinking of them first he searched both of them and all around them and then wholly tired and greatly disgusted he went home and to bed he decided that jimmy had gone over to mrs dolan's and that kindly woman had relented and taken him in of course that was where he was danny was up early in the morning he wanted to have the work done before mary and jimmy came home he fed the stock milked built a fire and began cleaning the stables as he wheeled the first barrow of manure to the heap he noticed a rooster giving danger signals behind the straw stack at the second load it was still there and danny went to see what alarmed it jimmy lay behind the stack where he had fallen face down and as danny tried to lift him he saw that he would have to cut him loose for he had frozen fast in the muck of the barnyard he had pitched forward among the rough cattle and horse tracks and fallen within a few feet of the entrance to a deep hollow eaten out of the straw by the cattle had he reached that shelter he would have been warm enough and safe for the night horrified danny whipped out his knife cut jimmy's clothing and carried him to his bed he covered him and hitching up drove at top speed for a doctor he sent the physician ahead and then rushed to mrs dolan's she saw him drive up and came to the door send mary home and ye come too danny called before she had time to speak jimmy lay out till last night and i'm afraid he's dead mrs dolan hurried in and repeated the message to mary she sat speechless while her sister bustled about putting on her wraps i ain't going she said shortly if i got sight of him i'd kill him if he wasn't dead oh yes you are going said katie dolan if he's dead you know it will save you being hanged for killing him get on these things of mine and hurry you got to go for decency's sake and keep a still tongue in your head danny mcnown is waiting for us together they went out and climbed into the carriage mary said nothing but danny was too miserable to notice you didn't find him then last night asked mrs dolan nah shivered danny i was in town twice i hunted almost all night at last i made sure you had taken him in and i went to bed it was three o'clock then i must have passed often within a few yards of him where was he asked katie behind the straw stack replied danny do you think he will die d cried danny jimmy d oh my god we mona let him mrs dolan took a furtive peep at mary who dry-eyed and white was staring straight ahead she was trembling and very pale but if katie dolan knew anything she knew that her sister's face was unforgiving and she did not in the least blame her danny reached home as soon as the horse could take them and under the doctor's directions all of them began work mary did what she was told but she did it deliberately and if danny had taken time to notice her he would have seen anything but his idea of a woman facing death for anyone she had ever loved mary's hurt went so deep mrs dolan had trouble to keep it covered some of the neighbors said mary was cold-hearted and some of them that she was stupefied with grief without stopping for food or sleep danny nursed jimmy 
he rubbed he bathed he poulticed he badgered the doctor and cursed his inability to do some good to everyone except danny jimmy's case was hopeless from the first he developed double pneumonia in its worst form and he was in no condition to endure it in the lightest his labored breathing could be heard all over the cabin and he could speak only in gasps on the third day he seemed a little better and when danny asked what he could do for him father michael jimmy panted and clung to danny's hand danny sent a man and remained with jimmy he made no offer to go when the priest came this is probably in the nature of a last confession, said Father Michael to Danny. I shall have to ask you to leave us alone. Danny felt the hand that clung to him relax, and the perspiration broke on his temple. Shall I go, Jimmy? he asked. Jimmy nodded. Danny arose heavily and left the room. He sat down outside the door and rested his head in his hands. The priest stood beside Jimmy. The doctor tells me it is difficult for you to speak, he said. I will help you all I can. I will ask questions, and you need only assent with your head or hand. Do you wish the last sacrament administered, Jimmy Malone? The sweat rolled off Jimmy's brow. He assented. Do you wish to make a final confession? A great groan shook Jimmy. The priest remembered a gay, laughing boy flinging back a shock of auburn hair his feet twinkling in the lead of the dance here was ruin to make the heart of compassion ache the father bent and clasped the hand of jimmy firmly the question he asked was between jimmy malone and his god the answer almost strangled him can you confess that mortal sin jimmy asked the priest the drops on jimmy's face merged in one bath of agony his hands clenched and his breath seemed to go no lower than his throat lied danny he rattled separate him and mary are you trying to confess that you betrayed a confidence of danny mcnown and married the girl who belonged to him yourself jimmy assented his horrified eyes hung on the priest's face and saw it turn cold and stern always the thing he had done had tormented him but not until the last summer had he begun to realize the depth of it and it had almost unseated his reason but not until now had come fullest appreciation and jimmy read it in the eyes filled with repulsion above him and with that sin on your soul you ask the last sacrament and the seal of forgiveness you have not wronged god and the holy catholic church as you have this man with whom you have lived for years while you possessed his rightful wife now he is here in deathless devotion fighting to save you you may confess to him if he will forgive you god and the church will ratify it and set the seal on your brow if not you die unshriven i will call danny mcnown one gurgling howl broke from the swollen lips of jimmy as danny entered the room the priest spoke a few words to him stepped out and closed the door danny hurried to jimmy's side he said you want to tell me something said danny what is it do you want me to do anything for you suddenly jimmy struggled to a sitting posture his popping eyes almost burst from their sockets as he clutched danny with both hands the perspiration poured in little streams down his dreadful face mary the next word was lost in a strangled gasp then came yours and then a queer rattle something seemed to give way the devils he shrieked the devils have got me snap his heart failed and jimmy malone went out to face his record unforgiven by man and unshriven by priest end of chapter nine to the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter chapter 10 danny's renunciation so they stretched jimmy's length on five mile hill beside the three babies that had lacked the vital spark 
Mary went to the Dolans for the winter, and Danny was left, sole occupant of Rainbow Bottom. Because so much fruit and food that would freeze were stored there, he was even asked to live in Jimmy's cabin. Danny began the winter stolidly. All day long, and as far as he could find anything to do in the night, he worked. He mended everything about both farms, rebuilt all the fences, and as a never-failing resource, he cut wood. He cut so much that he began to realize that it would get too dry, and the burning of it would become extravagant, so he stopped that and began making some changes he had long contemplated. During fur time he set his line of traps on his side of the river, and on the other he religiously set Jimmy's. But he divided the proceeds from the skins exactly in half, no matter whose traps caught them, and with Jimmy's share of the money he started a bank account for Mary. As he could not use all of them, he sold Jimmy's horses, cattle, and pigs. With half the stock gone, he needed only half the hay and grain stored for feeding. He disposed of the chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese that Mary wanted sold, and placed the money to her credit. He sent her a beautiful little red bank book and an explanation of all these transactions by Dolan. Mary threw the book across the room because she wanted Danny to keep her money himself, and then cried herself to sleep that night because Danny had sent the book instead of bringing it. But when she fully understood the transactions and realized that if she chose she could spend several hundred dollars, she grew very proud of that book. About the empty cabins and the barns, working on the farms, wading the mud and water of the river bank, or tingling with cold on the ice went two Dannys. The one a dull, listless man, mechanically forcing a tired, overworked body to action, and the other a self-accused murderer. I am responsible for the whole thing, he told himself many times a day. I always humored Jimmy. I always took the muddy side of the road and the big end of the log and the hard part of the work, and filled his traps with rats from my own. Why in God's name did I let the dell of stubbornness in me drive him to his death? No. Why didn't I let him have the black bass? Why didn't I make him come home and put on dry clothes? I killed him, just as sure as if I'd taken an axe and broken his head. Through every minute of the exposure of winter outdoors and the torment of it inside, Danny tortured himself. Of Mary, he seldom thought at all. She was safe with her sister, and although Danny did not know when or how it happened, he woke one day to the realization that he had renounced her. He had killed Jimmy. He could not take his wife and farm and Danny was so numb with long-suffering that he did not much care. There come times when troubles pile so deep that the edge of human feeling is dulled. He would take care of Mary, yes, she was as much Jimmy's as his farm, but he did not want her for himself now. If he had to kill his only friend, he would not complete his downfall by trying to win his wife. So through that winter Mary got very little consideration in the remorseful soul of Danny, and Jimmy grew, as the dead grow, by leaps and bounds, until by spring Danny had him well-nigh canonized. When winter broke, Danny had his future well mapped out, and that future was devotion to Jimmy's memory, with no more of Mary in it than was possible to keep out. He told himself that he was glad she was away, and he did not care to have her return. Deep in his soul he harbored the feeling that he had killed Jimmy to make himself look victor in her eyes in such a small manner as taking a fish, and deeper yet a feeling that everything considered, still she might mourn Jimmy more than she did. So Danny definitely settled that he always would live alone on the farms. Mary should remain with her sister, and at his death everything should be hers. The night he finally reached that decision the Kingfisher came home. Danny heard his rattle of exultation as he struck the embankment, and the suffering man turned his face to the wall and sobbed aloud, so that for a little time he stifled Jimmy's dying gasps that in wakeful night hours sounded in his ears. Early the next morning he drove through the village on his way to the county seat with a load of grain. Dolan saw him, and running home he told Mary, "'He will be gone all day. Now is your chance,' he said. Mary sprang to her feet. "'Hurry!' she panted. "'Hurry!' An hour later, a loaded wagon, a man and three women, drew up before the cabins in Rainbow Bottom. Mary, her sister, Dolan, and a scrubwoman entered. Mary pointed out the objects which she wished removed, and Dolan carried them out. They took up the carpets, swept down the walls, and washed the windows. They hung pictures, prints, and lithographs, and curtained the windows in dainty white. They covered the floors with bright carpets, and placed new ornaments on the mantel, and comfortable furniture in the rooms. There was a white iron bed, and several rocking chairs, and a shelf across the window filled with potted hyacinths in bloom. Among them stood a glass bowl containing three wonderful little goldfish, and from the top casing hung a brass cage from which a green linnet sang an exultant song. You should have seen Mary Malone. When everything was finished, she was changed the most of all. 
she was so sure of danny that while the winter had brought annoyance that he did not come it really had been one long glorious rest she laughed and sang and grew younger with every passing day as youth surged back with it returned roundness of form freshness of face and that bred the desire to be daintily dressed so of pretty light fabric she made many summer dresses for where morning she would not when calmness returned to mary she had told the dolans the whole story now do you expect me to grieve for the man she asked fifteen years with him through his lion tongue when by every right of our souls and our bodies danny mcnown and i belonged to each other mourn for him i'm glad he's dead glad glad if he had not died i should have killed him if danny did not it was a happy thing that he died his death saved me mortal sin i'm glad i tell you and i do not forgive him and i never will and i hope he will burn katie dolan clapped her hand over mary's mouth for the love of marcy don't say that she cried you will have to confess it and you'd be ashamed to face the priest i would not cried mary father michael knows i'm just an ordinary woman he don't expect me to be an angel but she left the sentence unfinished after mary's cabin was arranged to her satisfaction they attacked danny's emptying it cleaning it completely and refurnishing it from the best of the things that had been in both then mary added some new touches a comfortable big chair was placed by his fire new books on his mantel a flower in his window and new covers on his bed while the women worked dolan raked the yards and freshened matters outside as best he could when everything they had planned to do was accomplished the wagon loaded with the ugly old things mary despised drove back to the village and she with little tilly dolan for company remained mary was tense with excitement all the woman in her had yearned for these few pretty things she wanted for her home throughout the years that she had been compelled to live in crude ugly surroundings because every cent upon the plainest clothing and food went for drink for jimmy and treats for his friends now she danced and sang and flew about trying a chair here and another there to get the best effect every little while she slipped into her bedroom stood before a real dresser and pulled out its trays to make sure that her fresh light dresses were really there she shook out the dainty curtains repeatedly watered the flowers and fed the fish when they did not need it she babbled incessantly to the green linnet with which swollen throat rejoiced with her and occasionally she looked in the mirror she lighted the fire and put food to cook she covered a new table with a new cloth and set it with new dishes and placed a jar of her flowers in the center what a supper she did cook when she had waited until she was near crazed with nervousness she heard the wagon coming up the lane peeping from the window she saw danny stop the horses short and sit staring at the cabins and she realized that smoke would be curling from the chimney and the flowers and curtains would change the shining windows outside she trembled with excitement and then a great yearning seized her as he slowly drove closer for his brown hair was almost white and the lines on his face seemed indelibly stamped and then hot anger shook her fifteen years of her life wrecked and look at danny that was jimmy malone's work over and over throughout the winter she had planned this homecoming as a surprise to danny book fine were the things she intended to say to him when he opened the door and stared at her and about the altered room she swiftly went to him and took the bundles he carried from his arms hurry up and unhitch danny she said your supper is waiting and danny turned and stolidly walked back to his team without uttering a word uncle danny cried a child's voice please let me ride to the barn with you a winsome little maid came rushing to danny threw her arms about his neck and hugged him tight as he stooped to lift her her yellow curls were against his cheek and her breath was flower sweet in his face why didn't you kiss aunt mary she demanded daddy dolan always kisses mammy when he comes from all day gone aunt mary's worked so hard to please you and daddy worked and mammy worked and another woman you are pleased ain't you uncle danny who told you to call me uncle asked danny with unsteady lips she did announced the little woman flourishing the whip in the direction of the cabin danny climbed down to unhitch you are going to be my uncle ain't you as soon as it's a little over a year so folks won't talk who told you that panted danny hiding behind a horse nobody told me mammy just said it to daddy and i heard answered the little maid and i'm glad of it and so are all of us glad mammy said she'd just love to come here now when things would be like white folks mammy said aunt mary had suffered a lot more in her share say you won't make her suffer any more will you no moaned danny and staggered into the barn with the horses he leaned against a stall and shut his eyes he could see the bright room plainer than ever and that little singing bird sounded loud as any thunder in his ears and whether closed or open he could see mary never in all her life so beautiful never so sweet flesh and blood mary in a dainty dress with the shining unafraid eyes of girlhood 
It was that thing which struck Danny first and hit him the hardest. Mary was a careless girl again. When before had he seen her with neither trouble, anxiety, or worse yet fear in her beautiful eyes? And she had come to stay. She would not have refurnished her cabin otherwise. Danny took hold of the manger with both hands because his sinking knees needed bracing. Danny, called Mary's voice in the doorway, has my spickled hen showed any signs of setting yet? She's been over twa weeks, answered Danny. She's in that barrel there in the corner. Mary entered the barn, removed the prop, lowered the board, and kneeling, stroked the hen, and talked softly to her. She slipped a hand under the hen and lifted her to see the eggs. Danny, staring at Mary, noted closer the fresh, cleared skin, the glossy hair, the delicately colored cheeks, and the plumpness of the bare arms. One little wisp of curl lay against the curve of her neck, just where it showed rose pink and looked honey sweet. And in one great surge, the repressed steam of passion in the strong man broke, and Danny swayed against his horse. His tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he caught at the harness to steady himself, while he strove to grow accustomed to the fact that hell had opened in a new form for him. The old heart hunger for Mary Malone was back in stronger force than ever before, and because of him Jimmy lay stretched on Five Mile Hill. "'Danny, you are just fine,' said Mary. "'I've been almost wild to get home because I thought everything would be ruined, and instead of all that it's exactly the way I do it. Do hurry and get ready for supper.' Oh, it's so good to be home again. I want to make garden and fix my flowers and get some little chickens and turkeys into my fingers. I have to go home and wash and spruce up a bit for Lady, said Danny, leaving the barn. Mary made no reply, and it came to him that she expected it. Damned if I will, he said as he started home. If she wants to come here and force herself on me, she can, but she canna make me. Just then Danny stepped in his door and slowly gazed about him. In a way, his home was as completely transformed as hers. He washed his face and hands, and started for a better coat. His sleeping room shone with clean windows, curtained in snowy white. A freshly ironed suit of underclothing and a shirt lay on his bed. Danny stared at them. "'She thinks I'll tog up in them and come courtin,' he growled. "'I'll show her if I do. I winna touch em. To prove that he would not, Danny caught them up in a wad and threw them into a corner. That showed a clean sheet, fresh pillow, and new covers, invitingly spread back. Danny turned as white as the pillow at which he stared. "'That's a damn plain insinuation that I'm going to get in you,' he said to the bed, "'and go on living here. I didn't know as that child's jabber counts. For all I know, Mary may have already picked out some town dude to bring here and farm out on me, and they'll live with the birdcage, and I can go on climbing into ye alone.' Here was a new thought. Mary might mean only kindness to him again, as she had sent word by Jimmy she meant years ago. He might lose her for the second time and again a wave of desire struck Danny and left him staggering. "'Ain't you coming, Uncle Danny?' called the child's voice at the back door. "'What's your name, little lass?' inquired Danny. "'Tilly,' answered the little girl promptly. "'Well, Tilly, you go tell your Aunt Mary I have been in an elevator handling grain, and I'm covered with fine dust and chaff that sticks me. I can't come until I've had a bath and put on clean clothing. Tell her to go ahead.' The child vanished. In a second, she was back. She said she won't do it and take all the time you want, but I wish you'd hurry, for she won't let me either. Danny hurried, but the hasty bath and the fresh clothing felt so good he was in a softened mood when he approached Mary's door again. Tilly was waiting on the step and ran to meet him. Tilly was a dream. Almost, Danny understood why Mary had brought her. Tilly led him to the table and pulled back a chair for him, and he lifted her into hers, and as Mary set dish after dish of food on the table, Tilly filled in every pause that threatened to grow awkward with her chatter. Danny had been a very lonely man, and he did love Mary's cooking. Until then, he had not realized how sore a trial six months of his own had been. "'If I was a praying mon, I'd ask a blessing and thank God for this food,' said Danny. "'What's the matter with me?' asked Mary. "'I have never yet found anything,' answered Danny, "'and I do thank you for everything.' I believe I'm most thankful of all for the clean clothes and the clean bed. I'm afraid I was neglecting myself, Mary. Will you'll not be neglected any more, said Mary. Things have turned over a new leaf here. For all you give, you get some return after this. We are going to do business in a business-like way and divide even. I liked that bank account pretty well, Danny. Thank you for that. And don't think I spent all of it. I didn't spend a hundred dollars altogether. Not the price of one horse. 
but it made me so happy i could fly home again and the things i've always wanted and nothing to fear oh danny you don't know what it means to a woman to be always afraid my heart is almost jumping out of my body just with pure joy that the old fear is gone i know what it means to a man to be afraid said danny and vividly before him loomed the awful distorted dying face of jimmy mary guessed and her bright face clouded some day danny we must have a little talk she said and clear up a few things neither of us understand till then we will just farm and be partners and be as happy as ever we can i don't know as you mean to but if you do i warn you right now that you need never mention the name of jimmy malone to me again for any reason danny left the cabin abruptly now you gone and made him mad reproached tilly during the past winter mary had lived with other married people for the first time and she had imbibed some of mrs dolan's philosophy when he smells the biscuit i mean to make for breakfast he'll get glad again she said and he did but first he went home and tried to learn where he stood was he truly responsible for jimmy's death yes if he had acted like a man he could have saved jimmy he was responsible did he want to marry mary did he danny reached empty arms to empty space and groaned aloud would she marry him well now would she after years of neglect and sorrow danny knew that mary had learned to prefer him to jimmy but almost any man would have been preferable to a woman to jimmy jimmy was distinctly a man's man a jolly good fellow but he would not deny himself anything no matter what it cost his wife and he had been very hard to live with danny admitted that so mary had come to prefer him to jimmy that was sure but it was not a question between him and jimmy now it was between him and any marriageable man that mary might fancy he had grown old and gray and wrinkled though he was under forty mary had grown round and young and he had never seen her looking so beautiful surely she would want a man now as young and as fresh as herself and she might want to live in town after a while if she grew tired of the country could he remember jimmy's dreadful death realize that he was responsible for it and make love to his wife no she was sacred to jimmy could he live beside her and lose her to another man for the second time no she belonged to him it was almost daybreak when danny remembered the fresh bed and lay down for a few hours rest but there was no rest for danny and after tossing about until dawn he began his work when he carried the milk into the cabin and smelled the biscuit he fulfilled mary's prophecy got glad again and came to breakfast then he went about his work but as the day wore on he repeatedly heard the voice of the woman and the child combining in a chorus of laughter from the little front porch the green bird warbled and trilled neighbors who had heard of her return came up the lane to welcome the a happy mary malone the dead dreariness of winter melted before the spring sun and in danny's veins the warm blood swept up as the sap flooded the trees and in spite of himself he grew gladder and yet gladder he now knew how he had missed mary how he had loathed that empty silent cabin how remorse and heart hunger had gnawed at his vitals and he decided he would go on just as mary had said and let things drift and when she was ready to have the talk with him she had mentioned he would hear what she had to say and as he thought over these things he caught himself watching for furrows that jimmy was not making on the other side of the field he tried to talk to the robins and blackbird instead of jimmy but they were not such good company and when the day was over he tried not to be glad that he was going to the shining eyes of mary malone a good supper and a clean bed and it was not in the heart of man to do it the summer wore on autumn came and the year tilly had spoken of was over danny went his way doing the work of two men thinking of everything planning for everything and he was all the heart of mary malone could desire save her lover but little mary pieced it out danny never mentioned fishing he had lost his love for the river she knew that he frequently took walks to five mile hill his devotion to jimmy's memory was unswerving and at last it came to her that in death as in life jimmy malone was separating them she began to realize that there might be things she did not know what had jimmy told the priest why had father michael refused to confess jimmy till he sent danny to him what had passed between them if it was what she had thought all year why did it not free danny to her if there was something more what was it surely danny loved her much as he had cared for jimmy he had vowed that everything was for her first she was eager to be his wife and something bound him one day she decided to ask him the next she shrank in burning confusion for when jimmy malone had asked for her love she had admitted to him that she loved danny and jimmy had told her that it was no use danny did not care for girls and that he had said he wished she would not thrust herself upon him on the strength of that statement 
Mary married Jimmy inside five weeks and spent years in bitter repentance. That was the thing which held her now. If Danny knew what she did and did not care to marry her, how could she mention it? Mary began to grow pale and lose sleep, and Danny said the heat of the summer had tired her and suggested that she go to Mrs. Dolan's for a few weeks' rest. The fact that he was willing and possibly anxious to send her away for a whole week angered Mary. She went. End of chapter 10「Of At the Foot of the Rainbow – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wooly B. – At the Foot of the Rainbow by Jean Stratton Porter Chapter 11 – The Pot of Gold Mary had not been in the Dolan home an hour until Katie knew all she could tell of her trouble. Mrs. Dolan was practical. Go to see Father Michael, she said. What's he for but to help us? Go ask him what Jimmy told him. Tell him how you feel and what you know. He can tell you what Danny knows and then you will understand where you are at. Mary was on the way before Mrs. Dolan fully finished. She went to the priest's residence and asked his housekeeper to inquire if he would see her. He would, and Mary entered his presence strangely calm and self-possessed. This was the last fight she knew of that she could make for happiness, and if she lost, happiness was over for her. She had need of all her wit, and she knew it. Father Michael began laughing as he shook hands. "'Now look here, Mary,' he said. I've been expecting you. I warn you before you begin that I cannot sanction your marriage to a Protestant. Oh, but I'm going to convert him, cried Mary so quickly that the priest laughed harder than ever. So that's the lay of the land, he chuckled. Well, if you'll guarantee that, I'll give in. When shall I read the bans? Not until we get Danny's consent, answered Mary, and for the first time her voice wavered. He said, and is Danny dilatory? Danny is the finest man that will ever live in this world, said Mary, but he don't want to marry me. To my certain knowledge, Danny has loved you all your life, said Father Michael. He wants nothing here or hereafter as he wants to marry you. Then why don't he tell me so? sobbed Mary, burying her burning face in her hands. Has he said nothing to you? gravely inquired the priest. No, he hasn't, and I don't believe he intends to, answered Mary, wiping her eyes and trying to be composed. There is something about Jimmy that is holding him back. Mrs. Dolan thought you'd help me. What do you want me to do, Mary? asked Father Michael. Two things, answered Mary promptly. I want you to tell me what Jimmy confessed to you before he died, and then I want you to talk to Danny and show him that he is free from any promise that Jimmy might have got out of him. Will you? A dying confession, began the priest. Yes, but I know, broke in Mary. I saw them fight, and I heard Jimmy tell Danny that he'd lied to him to separate us. But he turned right around and took it back, and I knew Danny believed him then. But he can't after Jimmy confessed it again to both of you. What do you mean by saw them fight? Father Michael was leaning toward Mary anxiously. Mary told him. Then that is the explanation to the whole thing, said the priest. Danny did believe Jimmy when he took it back, and he died before he could repeat to Danny what he had told me. And I have the feeling that Danny thought himself in a way to blame for Jimmy's death. He was not. Oh, he was not, cried Mary Malone. Didn't I live there with them all those years? Danny was always as good as gold to Jimmy. It was shameful the way Jimmy imposed on him and spent his money and took me from him. It was shameful, shameful. Be calm, be calm, cautioned Father Michael. I agree with you. 
i am only trying to arrive at danny's point of view he well might feel that he was responsible if after humoring jimmy like a child all his life he at last lost his temper and dealt with him as if he were a man if that is the case he is of honor so fine that he would hesitate to speak to you no matter what he suffered and then it is clear to me that he does not understand how jimmy separated you in the first place and lied me into marrying him when i told him over and over how i loved danny jimmy malone took everything i had to give and he left me alone for fifteen years with my three little dead babies that died because i had no heart to desire life for them and he took my youth and he took my womanhood and he took my man mary arose in primitive rage you needn't bother she said i'm going straight to danny meself don't said father michael softly don't do that mary it isn't the accepted way there is a better let him come to you but he won't come he don't know he's in jimmy's grip tighter in death than he was in life mary began to sob again he will come said father michael be calm wait a little my child after all these years don't spoil a love that has been almost unequaled in holiness and beauty by anger at the dead let me go to danny we are good friends i can tell him jimmy made a confession to me that he was trying to repeat to him when punishment far more awful than anything you have suffered overtook him always remember mary he died unshriven mary began to shiver your suffering is over continued the priest you have many good years yet that you may spend with danny god will give you living children i am sure think of the years jimmy's secret has hounded and driven him think of the penalty he must pay before he gets a glimpse of paradise if he be not eternally lost i have exclaimed mary and it is nothing to the fact that he took danny from me and yet kept him in my home while he possessed himself for years may he burn mary let that suffice cried the priest he will the question now is shall i go to danny will you tell him just what jimmy told you will you tell him that i have loved him always yes said father michael will you go now i cannot i have work i will come early in the morning you will tell him everything she repeated i will promised father michael mary went back to mrs dolan's comforted she was anxious to return home at once but at last consented to spend the day now that she was sure danny did not know the truth her heart warmed toward him she was anxious to comfort and help him in the long struggle which she saw he must have endured by late afternoon she could bear it no longer and started back to rainbow bottom in time to prepare supper for the first hour after mary had gone danny whistled to keep up his courage by the second he had no courage to keep by the third he was indulging in the worst fit of despondency he had ever known he had told her to stay a week a week it would be an eternity there alone again could he bear it he got through to mid-afternoon some way and then in jealous fear and foreboding he became almost frantic one way or the other this thing must be settled fiercer raged the storm within him and at last toward evening it became unendurable at its height the curling smoke from the chimney told him that mary had to come home an unreasoning joy seized him he went to the barn and listened he could hear her moving about preparing supper as he watched she came to the well for water and before she returned to the cabin she stood looking over the fields as if trying to locate him Danny's blood ran hotly, and his pulses were leaping. Go to her, go to her now, demanded Passion, struggling to break leash. You killed Jimmy, you murdered your friend, cried Conscience, with unyielding insistence. Poor Danny gave one last glance at Mary, and then turned, and for the second time he ran from her as if pursued by demons. But 
this time he went straight to five mile hill and the grave of jimmy malone he sat down on it and within a few feet of jimmy's bones danny took his tired head in his hands and tried to think and for the life of him he could think but two things that he had killed jimmy and that to live longer without mary would kill him hour after hour he fought with his lifelong love for jimmy and his lifelong love for mary night came on the frost bit the wind chilled and the little brown owls screeched among the gravestones and danny battled on morning came the sun arose and shone on danny sitting numb with drawn face and bleeding heart mary prepared a fine supper the night before and patiently waited and when danny did not come she concluded that he had gone to town without knowing that she had returned tilly grew sleepy so she put the child to bed and presently she went herself father michael would make everything right in the morning but in the morning danny was not there and had not been mary became alarmed she was very nervous by the time father michael arrived he decided to go to the nearest neighbor and ask when danny had been seen last as he turned from the lane into the road a man of that neighborhood was passing on his wagon and the priest hailed him and asked him if he knew where danny macnown was back in five mile hill a man with his head on his knees is a settin on the grave of jim malone and i allow that would be danny macnown the damn fool he said father michael went back to the cabin and told mary he had learned where danny was and to have no uneasiness he would go to see him immediately and first of all you'll tell him how jimmy lied to him i will said the priest he entered the cemetery and walked slowly to the grave of jimmy malone danny lifted his head and stared at him i saw you said father michael and i came in to speak with you he took danny's hand you are here at this hour to my surprise i didna know that ye should be surprised at my comin to sit by jimmy at ony time coldly replied danny he was my only friend in life and another mon so fine i'll never know i often come here the priest shifted his weight from one foot to the other and then he sat down on a grave near danny for a year i've been waiting to talk with you he said danny wiped his face and lifting his hat ran his fingers through his hair as if to arouse himself his eyes were dull and listless i am afraid i am no fit to talk sensibly he said i am much troubled some other time could you tell me your trouble asked father michael danny shook his head i have known mary malone all her life said the priest softly and been her confessor I have known Jimmy Malone all his life, and heard his dying confession. I know what it was he was trying to tell you when he died. Think again. Danny McNown stood up. He looked at the priest intently. Did ye come here purposely to find me? Yes. What do ye want? To clear your mind of all trouble, and fill your heart with love, and great peace and rest our heavenly father knows that you need peace of heart and rest danny to fill my heart with peace ye will have to prove to me that i'm no responsible for the death of jimmy malone and to give it rest ye will have to prove to me that i'm free to marry his wife ye can do neither of those things i can do both said the priest calmly my son that is what i came to do Danny's face grew whiter and whiter as the blood receded and his big hands gripped at his sides. Aye, but ye canna, he cried desperately. Ye canna. I can, said the priest. Listen to me. Did Jimmy get to anything at all said to you? He said, Mary, and then he choked on the next word. Then he gasped out yours, and it was over. Had you any idea what he was trying to tell you? Nah, answered Danny. 
he was mortal sick and half delirious and i paid little heed if he lived he would tell me when he was better if he died nothing mattered for i was responsible and better friend mon never had there was nothing on earth jimmy wouldna have done for me he was so big-hearted so generous my god how i have missed him how i have missed him your faith in jimmy is strong ventured the bewildered priest for he did not see his way danny lifted his head the sunshine was warming him and his thoughts were beginning to clear my faith in jimmy malone is so strong he said that if i lost it i should never trust another living mon he had his faults to others i admit that but he never had only to me he was my friend and above my life i loved him i would gladly die to save him and yet you say you are responsible for his death let me tell ye cried danny eagerly and began on the story the priest wanted to hear from him as he finished father michael's face lighted what folly he said that a man of your intelligence should torture yourself with the thought of responsibility in a case like that any one would have claimed the fish in those circumstances priest that i am i would have had it even if i fought for it any man would and as for what followed it was bound to come he was a tortured man and a broken one if he had not lain out that night he would a few nights later and it was not in your power to save him no man can be saved from himself danny did what he said make no impression on you enough that i would have killed him with my naked hands if he hadn't have taken it back of course he had to retract if i had believed that of jimmy after the life we lived together i would curse god and mon and break for woods and live and die there alone then what was he trying to tell you when he died asked the bewildered priest to take care of mary i judge not to marry her and take her for your own danny began to tremble remember i talked with him first said father michael and what he confessed to me he knew was final he died before he could talk to you but i think it is time to tell you what he wanted to say he he was trying trying to tell you that there was nothing but love in his heart for you that he did not in any way blame you that that mary was yours that you were free to take her that what cried danny wildly are ye sure oh my god perfectly sure answered father michael jimmy knew how long and faithfully you had loved mary and she had loved you mary had loved me careful mon are you sure i know said father michael convincingly i give you my priestly word i know and jimmy knew and was altogether willing he loved you deeply as he could love any one danny and he blamed you for nothing at all the only thing that would have brought jimmy any comfort in dying was to know that you would end your life with mary and not hate his memory hate cried danny hate father michael if ye have come to tell me that danny and i held me responsible for his death and he was willing for me to have mary your face looks like the face of god to me danny gripped the priest's hand are ye sure are ye sure mon he almost lifted father michael from the ground i tell you i know go and be happy some other day i will try to thank ye said danny turning away no i'm in a little of a hurry he was halfway to the gate when he turned back does mary know this he asked she does said the priest you are one good man danny go and be happy and may the blessing of god go with you danny lifted his hat and jimmy too he said put jimmy in father michael may the peace of god rest the troubled soul of jimmy malone said father michael and not being a catholic danny did not know that from the blessing for which he had asked 
he hurried away with the brightness of dawn on his lined face which looked almost boyish under his whitening hair mary malone was at the window and turmoil and bitterness were beginning to burn in her heart again maybe the priest had not found danny maybe he was not coming maybe a thousand things then he was coming coming straight and sure coming across the fields and leaping fences at a bound coming with such speed and force as comes the strong man fifteen years denied mary's heart began to jar and thump and waves of happiness surged over her and then she saw that look of dawn of serene delight on the face of the man and she stood aghast danny threw wide the door and crossed her threshold with outstretched arms is it true he panted that thing that father michael told me is it true will ye be mine mary malone at last will ye be mine oh my girl is the beautiful thing that the priest told me true the beautiful thing that the priest told him mary malone swung a chair before her and stepped back wait she cried sharply there must be some mistake tell me exactly what father michael told you he told me that jimena held me responsible for his death that he loved me when he died that he was willing i should have ye oh mary wasn't a that splendid of him wasn't he a grand man mary come to me say that it's true tell me if ye love me mary malone stared wide-eyed at danny and gasped for breath danny came closer at last he had found his tongue for the love of mercy if ye are coming to me come new mary he begged my arms will split if they dinna get round ye soon dear jimmy told me fra sixteen years ago how i loved ye and he told me when he came back how sorry ye for me and he he almost cried when he told me i never saw a mon feel so grand old jimmy no other mon like him mary drew back in desperation you see here danny mcnown she screamed you see here i do broke in danny i'm looking all i ever saw or see now or shall see till i d is here when here is ye mary malone oh if a woman could ever understand what passion means to a man if ye knew what i have suffered through all these years you'd end it mary malone mary gave the chair a shove come here danny she said danny cleared the space between them mary set her hands against his breast one minute she panted just one i have loved ye all my life me man i never loved any one but you i never wanted any one but you i never hoped for any heaven better than i knew i'd find in your arms there was a mistake there was an awful mistake when i married jimmy i'm not telling you now and i never will but you must realize that do you understand me hardly breathed danny hardly Weel, you can take your time if you want to think it out because that's all i'll ever give you there was a horrible mistake it was you i loved and wanted to marry now bend down to me danny mcnown because i'm going to take your head on me breast and kiss your dear face until i'm tired said mary malone an hour later father michael came leisurely down the lane and the peace of god was with him a radiant mary went out to meet him you didn't tell him she cried accusingly you didn't tell him the priest laid a hand on her head mary the greatest thing in the whole world is self-sacrifice he said the pot at the foot of the rainbow is just now running over with the pure gold of perfect contentment but had you and i done such a dreadful thing as to destroy the confidence of a good man in his friend your heart never could know such joy as it now knows in this sacrifice of yours and no such blessed shining light could illumine your face that is what i wanted to see i said to myself as i came along she will try but she will learn as i did that she cannot look in his eyes and undeceive him and when she becomes reconciled her face will be so good to see and it is 
you did not tell him either mary malone end of chapter eleven the pot of gold recording by woolly b end of at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter one of at the foot of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kevin davidson at the foot of the rainbow by jean stratton porter the rat catchers of the wabash hey you sweet scented little hot wama cried jimmy malone as he lifted his tenth trap waded with a struggling muskrat from the wabash varmint ye may be to all the rest of creation but ye mean a night at cases to me jimmy whistled softly as he reset the trap for the moment he forgot that he was five miles from home that it was a mile farther to the end of his line at the lower curve of horseshoe bend that his feet and fingers were almost freezing and that every rat of the tin now in the bag on his back had made him thirstier he shivered as the cold wind sweeping the curves of the river struck him but when an unusually heavy gust dropped the ice and snow from a branch above him on the back of his head he laughed as he ducked and cried keep ye snowballin to the further delay will ye chick a dee 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 remarked a tiny gray bird on the tree above him jimmy glanced up chicky 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 he said I can't tell by your dress whether you're a hen or a rooster, but I can tell by your employment that you are working for grub. Have to hustle lively for every grub you find, don't you, Chicky? Now me, I'm hustling lively for a drink. And I'll be dumb if it seems necessary, with the whole river a drinking stuff flowing right under my feet. But the old Wabash ain't running, wine and milk and honey, not by the jugful. It seems to be compounded of equal parts of mud, crude oil, and rainwater. If it was only running Melwood, big horror, chicky, you'd see a mermaid named Jimmy Malone sitting on the kingfisher stump, combing his auburn hair with the breeze and scooping whiskey down its gullet with its fin tail. No, hold on, chicky, you wouldn't either. I'm too flat-chisted for a mermaid, and I'll have no time to lave off gurgling for the hair combing act, which, Chicky, to me notion, is as essential to a mermaid as the curves. I'll be a sucker, the biggest sucker in the gar-hole, Chicky Bird. I'll be an all-day sucker, big gobs, yes, and all-night sucker, too. Come to think of it, Chicky, be dumb if I'd be a sucker at all. Look at the mouse at him, puckered up with a drawstring. Oh, hell on the Wabash, Chicky. Think of Jimmy Malone, lying at the bottom of the river, flowing with Melwood and a puckering string mouth. Wouldn't that break the heart of you? I know what I'd be. I'd be the black bass of Horseshoe Bend, Chicky, and I'd locate just below the shoals a head and upstream, and I'd hold me mouth wide open till I paralyzed me jaws so that I couldn't shut them. I just let the pure stuff wash over me gills. Constant, word without end. Goodbye, Chicky. Hope you got your grub, and pretty soon I'll have enough to drink to make me feel like I was the bass for one night anyway. Jimmy hurried to his next trap, which was empty, but the one after that contained a rat, and there were footprints in the snow. That's where the porridge heart of the Scotchman's comes in, said Jimmy, as he held up the rat by one foot and gave it a sharp rap over the head with the trap to make sure it was dead. Danny could no more hear a rat fast in one of me traps and not come over and put it out of its misery than he could dance a hornpipe, and him only second hand from hornpipe land too. But his feet's like lead, poor Danny. He gets just about half the rats I do. He never did have luck. Jimmy's gay face clouded for an instant. The twinkle faded from his eyes, and a look of unrest swept into them. He muttered something, and, catching up his bag, shoved in the rat. As he reset the trap, a big crow dropped from branch to branch on a sycamore above him, and his back scarcely was turned before it alighted on the ice and ravenously picked at three drops of blood purpling there. Away down the ice-sheeted river led Danny's trail, showing plainly across the snow blanket. 
The wind raved through the trees and around the curves of the river. The dark earth of the banks, peeping from under overhanging ice and snow, looked like the entrance to deep, mysterious caves. Jimmy's superstitious soul readily peopled them with goblins and devils. He shuddered and began to talk aloud to cheer himself. Eleven muskrat skins, times fifteen cents a pace, one dollar sixty-five. That will buy more than I can hold, Haggini. Won't I be taking one long fine gugle the pure stuff? And there's the boys. I might do the grand for once. One on me for a house, and I might be back something on me back score. But first I'll drink till I swell like a poison pup. And I ought to get Mary that milk pail she's been kicking for this last month. Women and cows always a kicking. If the brasted cow hadn't kicked a hole in the pail, there'd be no need of Mary kicking for a new one. But though is dubious sorrin, Mary says it's bad enough on the dishpan. But it positively ain't healthy about the milk pail, and she is right. We ought to have a new pail. I guess I'll get it first, and fill up on what's left. One for a quarter will do, and I've several traps yet. I might get a few more rats. The virtuous resolve to buy a milk pail before he quenched the thirst which burned him so elated Jimmy with good opinion of himself that he began whistling gaily as he strode toward his next trap and by that token Danny McNoon, resetting an empty trap a quarter of a mile below, knew that Jimmy was coming, and that, as usual, luck was with him. Catching his blood and water-dripping bag, Danny dodged a rotten branch that came crashing down under the weight of its icy load, and stepping out on the river, he pulled on his patched wool linen mittens as he waited for Jimmy. "'How many, Danny?' called Jimmy from afar. Seven, answered Danny. "'What for ye?' Ye livin', replied Jimmy with a bit of unconscious swagger. I'm having poor luck today. How money would satisfy ye? asked Danny sarcastically. I ain't got time to figure out, answered Jimmy, working in a double shuffle as he walked. Thrash you round a little, Danny. It will warm you up. I'm no cold, answered Danny. The cold? imitated Jimmy. No cold? Come to observe you closer. I do detect symptoms of sunstroke in the redness of your face, and the whiteness about your mouth, but the frost on your neck scarf and the icicles festooned on the tail of your coat tell a different story. Denny, you remind me the bad teas in the peacocks last winter. Pete's nothing but skin and bone, and he'd never had a square meal in his life to warm him. It took pushing and pudding to get him into the water, and the scum froze over while he was under. Pete came up shaken like the feeder on a thrashing machine, and when he could speak at all, "'Bless Jesus,' he says, "'I'm just as w warm as I w want to be.' "'So are you, Denny, but there's difference on how warm folks want to be. For myself now, I could easily bear more heat.' "'It's honest. I'm not cold,' insisted Danny, and he might have added that if Jimmy would not fill his system with Casey's poisons, that degree of cold would not chill and pinch him either. But being Danny, he neither thought it nor said it. "'Why, I'm frozen to me soul!' cried Jimmy, as he changed the rat-bag to his other hand and beat the empty one against his leg. "'Say, Denny, where do you think the kingfisher is wintering?' "'And the black bass,' answered Danny. "'Where do you suppose the black bass is new?' "'Strange you should mention the black bass,' said Jimmy. "'I was just having a little talk about him with a friend of mine named Chicky Dom, "'no, Chicky D, who works a grub stick back there. "'The bass might be lying in the river bed, right under our feet. "'Don't you remember the time when I put on three big cutworms "'and skittered them beyond the log that lays across here, "'and he leapt from the water till we both saw him the best we ever did, "'and nothing but my old rotten line ever saved him.' or he might be where it slumps off, just below the kingfisher stump. But I know where he is, all right. He's down in the gar hole. He'll come back here sporting time, and chase minnows when the kingfisher comes home. But, Danny, where the nation do you suppose the kingfisher is? Not so far away as you might think, replied Danny. Doc Hughes told me that coming on the train for Indianapolis on the 15th of December, he saw one fly across a little pond just below Winchester. I believe they go south slowly, as the cold drives them, and stop near as they can find good fishing. Dinner that stump looked lonely without him. 
ain't sound lonely without the bass slashing around, and going to have that bass this summer, if I don't do a thing but fish, vowed Jimmy. I'll surely have a try at him, answered Danny with a twinkle in his gray eyes. And our reputation for taking good fish is ahead of anyone on the river, except the kingfisher. Why the devil did not want us haul out that bass? Ain't I just told you that I'm going to hook him this summer? shivered Jimmy. Then all you hear me mention I intended to take a tie at him myself? questioned Danny. Have ye forgotten I know how to fish? Nuff breeze today without startin' the Highlander, interposed Jimmy hastily. I believe I hear a rat in my next trap. It will make me twelve, and it's good and glad of it I am, for I've got to walk to town when my line is reset. There's something Mary wants. If Mary wants you to go to town, why do not you leave me to finish your traps and start now? asked Danny. It's getting dark. If ye are so late you cannot see the drifts, you never can cut across the fields, for the snow is piled waist high, and it's a mile farther by the road. I get the skins me rats first, or I'll be having to ask credit again, replied Jimmy. That's easy, answered Danny. Turn your rats over to me, Rick Nu. I'll give you market price for them in cash. But the skinning of them, objected Jimmy, for decency's sake, though his eyes were beginning to shine and his fingers to tremble. Never you mind about that, retorted Danny. I like to take my time to it and fix them up nice. Eleven, did you say? Eleven, answered Jimmy, breaking into a jig, supposedly to keep his feet warm, in reality because he could not stand quietly while Danny pulled off his mittens, got out and unstrapped his wallet, and carefully counted out the money. Is that all you need? he asked. For an instant Jimmy hesitated. Missing a chance to get even a few cents more meant a little shorter time at Casey's. That's enough, I think, he said. I wish I'd stayed out of matrimony, and then maybe I could ever have a cent of me own. You ought to be glad you haven't a woman to consume every penny you earn before it reaches your pockets, Denny McNoon. I had never seen Mary consume much but calico and food. Danny said dryly. Oh, it ain't so much what a woman really spins, said Jimmy peevishly as he shoved the money into his pocket and pulled on his mittens. It's what you know she would spin if she had the chance. I did not think you'd break up on that, laughed Danny. And that was what Jimmy wanted. So long as he could set Danny laughing, he could mold him. No, but I'll break down, lamented Jimmy in sore self-pity as he remembered the quarter sacred to the purchase of the milk pail. "'You go on and hurry,' urged Danny. "'If you did not start home by seven, I'll be combing the drifts for you before morning.' "'Anything I can do for you?' asked Jimmy, tightening his old red neck-scarf. "'Yes,' answered Danny. "'Do your errand and start straight home. Your teeth are chattering new. A little more exposure, and the rheumatism will be grinding you again. You will hurry, Jimmy.' "'Sure.' cried Jimmy, ducking under a snowslide and breaking into a whistle as he turned toward the road. Danny's gaze followed Jimmy's retreating figure, till he climbed the bank and was lost in the woods, and the light in his eyes was the light of love. He glanced at the sky and hurried down the river, first across to Jimmy's side to gather his rats and reset his traps, then to his own. But luck seemed to have turned, for all the rest of Danny's were full, and all of Jimmy's were empty. But as he was gone, it was not necessary for Danny to slip across and fill them, as was his custom when they worked together. He would divide the rats at skinning time, so that Jimmy would have just twice as many as he, because Jimmy had a wife to support. The last trap of the line lay a little below the curve of Horseshoe Bend, and there Danny twisted the tops of the bags together, climbed the bank, and struck across Rainbow Bottom. He settled his load on his shoulders and glanced ahead to choose the shortest route. He stopped suddenly with a quick intake of breath. God, he cried reverently, who beautiful are thy works. The ice-covered Wabash circled Rainbow Bottom like a broad white frame, and inside it was a perfect picture wrought in crystal white and snow shadows. The blanket on the earth lay smoothly in even places, rose with knolls, fell with valleys, curved over prostrate logs, heaped in mounds where bushes grew thickly, and piled high in drifts where the wind blew free. In the shelter of the bottom the wind had not stripped the trees of their loads as it had those along the river. 
the willows maples and soft woods bent almost to earth with their shining branches but the stout stiffly upstanding trees the oaks elms and cottonwoods defied the elements to bow their proud heads while the three mighty trunks of the great sycamore in the middle looked white as the snow and dwarfed its companions as it never had in summer its wide-spreading branches were sharply cut against the blue background and they tossed their frosted balls in the face of heaven the giant of rainbow bottom might be broken but it never would bend every clamoring vine every weed and dried leaf wore a coat of lace-webbed frostwork the wind swept a mist of tiny crystals through the air and from the shelter of the deep woods across the river a cardinal whistled gaily the bird of good cheer whistling no doubt on an empty crop made danny think of jimmy and his unfailing fountain of mirth dear jimmy would he ever take life seriously how good he was to tramp to town and back after five miles on the ice he thought of mary with almost a touch of impatience what did the woman want that was so necessary to send a man to town after a day on the ice jimmy would be dog-tired when he got home danny decided to hurry and do the feeding and get in the wood before he began to skin the rats he found walking uncertain he plunged into unsuspected hollows and weighted drifts so that he was panting when he reached the lane from there he caught the gray curl of smoke against the sky from one of the two log cabins side by side at the top of the embankment and he almost ran towards them mary might think they were late at the traps or be out doing the feeding and it would be cold for a woman on reaching his own door he dropped the rat bags inside and then hurried to the yard of the other cabin he gathered a big load of wood in his arms and stamping the snow from his feet called open at the door danny stepped inside and filled the empty box the smarting eyes he turned to mary as he brushed the snow and moss from his sleeves nothing but luck today he said jimmy took eleven fine skins for his traps before he started to town and i got five more that are his and i hae eight of my own mary looked such a dream to danny standing there all pink and warm and tidy in her fresh blue dress that he blinked and smiled half bewildered what did jimmy go to town for she asked whatever it was she wanted answered danny what was it i wanted persisted mary hey do not tell me replied danny and the smile wavered my either said mary and she stooped and picked up her sewing danny went out and gently closed the door he stood for a second on the step forcing himself to take an inventory of the work there were the chickens to feed and the cows to milk feed and water but the teams must be fed and bedded a fire in his own house made and two dozen rats skinned and the skins put to stretch and cure and at the end of it all instead of a bed and rest there was every probability that he must drive to town after jimmy for jimmy could get helpless enough to freeze in the drift on a dollar sixty-five ah jimmy jimmy muttered danny i wish she wadna and he was not thinking of himself but of the eyes of the woman inside so danny did all the work and cooked his supper because he never ate in jimmy's cabin when jimmy was not there then he skinned rats and watched the clock because if jimmy did not come by eleven it meant he must drive to town and bring him home no wonder jimmy chilled at the trapping when he kept his blood on fire with whiskey at half past ten danny was scarcely half the rats finished went out into the storm and hitched to the signal buggy. Then he tapped at Mary Malone's door, quite softly, so that he would not disturb her if she had gone to bed. She was not sleeping, however, and the loneliness of her slight figure, as she stood with the lighted room behind her, struck Danny forcibly, so that his voice trembled with pity as he said, "'Mary, I've run out of mercurin compound, just in the middle of skinning the finest bunch of rats we've taken for the traps this winter.' I am going to drive to town for some more before the stores close, and we will be back in less than an hour. I thought I'd tell ye, so if you wanted me, you would know why I did not answer. You will not be afraid, will you? No, replied Mary. I won't be afraid. Bolt the doors and pile on plenty of wood to keep ye warm, said Danny as he turned away. Just for a minute Mary stared out into the storm. Then a gust of wind nearly swept her from her feet, and she pushed the door shut. 
and slid the heavy bolt into place. For a little while she leaned and listened to the storm outside. She was a clean, neat, beautiful Irish woman. Her eyes were wide and blue, her cheeks pink, and her hair black and softly curling about her face and neck. The room in which she stood was neat as its keeper. The walls were whitewashed and covered with prints, pictures, and some small tan skins. Dried grasses and flowers filled the vases on the mantel. The floor was neatly carpeted with a striped rag carpet, and in the big open fireplace a wood fire roared. In an opposite corner stood a modern cooking stove, a pipe passing through a hole in the wall, and a door led into a sleeping room beyond. As her eyes swept the room they rested finally on a framed lithograph of the Virgin with the infant in her arms. Slowly Mary advanced her gaze fast on the serene picture of the mother clasping her child. Before it she stood staring. Suddenly her breast began to heave, and big tears brimmed from her eyes and slid down her cheeks. "'Since ye look so wise, why don't you tell me why?' she demanded. "'Oh, if you have any mercy, tell me why!' Then before the steady look in the calm eyes, she hastily made the sign of the cross, and slipping to the floor, she laid her head on a chair and sobbed aloud. End of chapter one. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com.